So Rook C4 check. Uh -oh. And now Rook... Oh, did he blunder? Yeah, no, no, he did blunder. He could have played Rook E7. He should have started with Rook E7. That makes so much sense. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, he blundered he back. It. He missed me. Oh, no. He had to go Rook E8 himself. And you get a blunder. And you get a blunder. And you get a blunder. <laughs> and, you, and, and you, and you, and you, and you're going to blunder. Sorry. Hess hitting the high note. No, that just, it had to happen. Oh, my God. I tricked you. I tricked everybody. I tried to do like the most dandy wrench hairstyle I could. It didn't really work, but you know, this, uh, the hair here. You're not, you're not Danny. I'm not Danny, no. But I tricked everybody. I'm uh, here with Alexandra Botez, the one, the only, pulling that double duty ship today. Um, you know, Robert loves Hess so much. He kidnapped Danny, who's duct taped to the back of his closet, so he could do this. You know, I just Dan, <laughs> Dan, Danny's got other things to do, but you know, I just I try to get like I, I had to get a little refresher. I went to the bathroom. I was like washing myself. I was like, how can I be more like Danny? I could say I got a ticket to two for two to Blunder Town. Alexandra, you coming with me? No, because you're going to Sack Town, USA. And you know, I, I don't, I don't really get it. I've just got, you know. I, I laughed a little hard at that one. Um, but it's good to have you back, Robert. Your energy is endless. Let's see how long you can hold up before you fall asleep. I mean, you know, just, just trying my best out here. So, who? Everyone who's been here for a while has been listening to me for hours. They're tired of me, right? They're just... Uh, no, they want more. I, well, we all make mistakes, right? I mean, just some people make them more frequently than others. Hashtag chess reference, sort of, because, you know, the better you are, the fewer mistakes... Okay, whatever. I don't know where I'm going with that. That's okay. I know what's going to refuel you, chess games. You always need to be looking at some type of chess. And the good news is that the second Battle Royale has started today, um, and the games are off. Yeah, people, all right, so where, which matchups, we have so many. Oh, I see Mama Jara playing Georg Meyer. So, yep. um, you know, got to give that, out. That seems, that seems like the one we should check out real quick. Yep. Um, I see Joe Smock saying, Joke Town Population Hess. Yeah, I mean. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
my LDA. This is the funniest and the least funny person in that town. It's yeah, great. That's true. And the only one. It's a reservation for yeah. one all the time. No lines, nothing. That's that's just good. Someone says, what makes you grumpy besides Pro Chess League? You know what makes me grumpy? Slow walkers. Huge pet peeve of mine. I'm from New York City. You're such a New Yorker. I'm such a New Yorker. You know, I drink my coffee. Yeah. I have the answer to all the questions. I actually don't drink coffee, but I do have the answers, hopefully, to chess questions. So ooh. That's good. I, I saw there was a prank video where they separated a sidewalk in half in New York, one for New Yorkers and one for tourists because they walk at different paces. I feel like you would have liked that. <laughs> I would have, for sure. Uh, I mean, they actually kind of need that, but that's this is a whole nother conversation. I've talked literally zero chess, and it feels great, just for the record. I'm just saying, I'm you know, been talking chess for hours. I just took a little bit of a break here, but um, yeah. So what what do we do now? Where do we go to? All right. So um, the game between Ari and Tari and Gaio and Jones also looks interesting. Whoa. I think it's a more instruct instructive game to start with. I agree. So, the first thing I notice, obviously, is that the queens have been traded off very early in the game, yep. as well as three of the pawns here, in white's case, and two for black. So black is up a pawn, yep. but his piece development is a little bit more awkward. Who do you think has the better position here? Yeah, it's actually really tough to evaluate positions like this because it's an imbalance. Black, as you said, is up a pawn, but white mm -hmm. clearly has more development. And don't be fooled. This pawn on b4 is not a second pawn. It's not free because rook f to d1 happens and your bishop on d7 is going to pay the full price because you go knight c6 back to block it. I can simply take on c6 and put my knight on e5 and say, well, that's a free piece. Pinning and winning, right? As I always yeah. say. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for black to develop fully because you should probably make a move like f6 just to stop my knight from coming to e5, at least make that move mm -hmm. at some point. But as soon as you play f6, Look at your bishop on f8. It feels like it's feeling a little more cramped than it already does. So I don't know. Right. Yeah, I, I think I actually would prefer to play white here just because how of how difficult it is for black to develop. Then again, if black is able to develop, he's just going to have the outright better end game. Right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, king to e8 is kind of awkward. You know, it's... He, it, He's, he's doing the uh, dad bod shuffle between D8 and E8. <laughs> so. You know, is, is that what all the cool kids are doing these days? Uh, I wouldn't say cool kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, dad jokes are all the rage, even though they're often terrible and not really funny at all. But, you know, we all got to make dad jokes every now and then. Shout out to Danny Wrench, you know. got to. Yeah, and... And I'll just say hi to a couple of people in chat since I just got here. BJH has been putting in that hard mod work for quite a while. Chess Bay, I don't know if you're still here, but you were doing a lot of work as well. Oh, she's still here. And hi, Joe Bruin. Welcome back to the chat. Mun Ban Mun Bun Ovich. Man Bun Ovich? Okay. Come on. Man Bun Ovich. It's a man bun. Okay, his name is hard to say. Yeah, you but New Yorkers with your hard names. Man Bun Ovich is like, you know, Ovich is that Russian ending, which, you know. Yeah. Anyway, chess. I gotta. I gotta... Chess. Yeah. So, so he did just play f6, like you said. Can I? Uh, sorry, I, yeah. I did not mean to uh, to cut you off there. But the game between Tesla 37 and Arturchik just caught my eye because I see many oh. dark square diagonals. Problematic. Look, this move bishop b6. It attacks this rook on d8. But if I go queen to c6, you can't take my rook on d8 because bishop c5. Well, maybe you can, but I respond with bishop to c5, pinning mm -hmm. your rook on f2. So I'm not really sure who's getting the better deal here uh, by the, you know, all these rook attacks, but I'm thinking that black should be perfectly okay in this situation. Yeah, this looks like a solid way to defend that exchange here since black is likely to get it back. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, did you see the chat? Did you see the comment by dad of dog? Um, I'm looking at it now. Robert, how about a shout out to your dad? Yeah, that's my dad. That's oh, act actually. Yeah, so you get a shout out to your dad. Your dad should get a shout out. Yeah. Ovich means son of, so you would be. Carlovich. Dad of dog Ovich. Oh, dad of dog. Wow. That... Dad of dogovich. Don't tempt. Not a bad name. You don't need to tempt my dad anymore. 
then you know he's already tempted to make endless jokes at my expense. So <laughs> that's what dads are for, though. Um, okay, so he played Queen C4 instead. Yep. So a sim similar idea that if you take my rook on D8, I'll play Bishop C5, and maybe the Queen on C4 is a little bit better placed. It doesn't get in the way of the bishop. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Perhaps there's just maybe more points of access from C4, but. Yeah. It seems like it could be more active on c4 than on c6, but I would be a little bit worried about getting my queen trapped, although it doesn't seem like it's going to be the case. So he's fine there. Yeah, so I'll just let his queen sit. He'll figure it out. Um, Your dad agrees with me. <laughs> oh, this is a great start to my day. Well, you know also my sister's name is Alex, right? So... Oh, good choice. Yeah, this, good is, choice. this is funny. Also, we, get, we need a Papa Hess versus Papa Botez game with their son and daughter at commentary. What's your dad's strength at chess? 1,800. Oh, your dad's better than my dad. Dad, you got to study. Oh, we should do it then. We should do it. <laughs> you you got to study. So this is going to have to be some training. I think my dad's like, I don't even know, maybe 1,400? I'm not sure. That's okay. Um my dad is a little bit rusty. He's not as good at blitz and bullet, so. Okay, well, um, we'll see how this plays out. B4, taking over that C4, C5 square, excuse me. Uh, the reason I don't like this is now when this second rook comes to C8, right down the C file is going to be a problem. Yeah, the, the C2 pawn looks terrible. Um, but even if white loses the C2 pawn, white will probably be able to take E4 later. You're speaking like a true French player. I feel like, you know, losing a pawn, but still because there's a not great bishop necessarily on b7 um, that you can have compensation for it. Well, would you not want to take the pawn on e4 here if you're away? No, he's definitely going for that pawn right away, but I would actually consider a move like bishop to h4 here. And the reason why, I mean, I, maybe not necessarily right this second, but bishop h4 has the mm -hmm. benefit of provoking the move g3. And if white plays right. g3, then you're going to have a much harder time taking this pawn on e4 because you open the full length of that diagonal. Uh, I would just Yeah, I don't want to open those light squares for the bishop and queen. That looks very dangerous. Yeah. So I think just rook c8 here is probably ideal. Um, you know, I just put my piece on good squares. And here, for example, if we take on e4, which you can do, but knight e4, queen e4, queen trade on e4, uh, bishop e4, rook e4, rook d1 check at least picks up the pawn on c2. So that's like a very long variation here that gives black the opportunity to get the better side of an equal material endgame. So we'll see if Mo Sessian has it in him to pull a win out of a slightly better position, but I like his chances thus far. Okay, well, I saw a game that I like the chances of white even better. I think we should check it out. It's the game between Klein Beer 98 and Jay Josu. White has a really nice attack Whoa. here. I think the queens are going to be traded off, but the rook and knight will still be pointing towards h7, so the black king is having a pretty bad day at work so far. I feel like every time I see a Thomas Beardson game, he's checkmating his opponent. Is that, is that accurate? Can somebody confirm this? Has he checkmated literally every single opponent he's played in the pro chess Yeah, league? he must have a perfect score so far. I mean, this, this idea, right, knight h6 check, and then knight takes f7, it's somewhat typical when you distract the king away from the protection of the h7 pawn. But here the big problem is if you take on f7 with the knight, I just go to sack town, rook takes h7 check, king h7, rook f7 sack check. Sack town? I guess we do have Danny uh, wrench today. I mean, I, you know, I try to let everybody know I'm going to do my best Danny impersonation. Danny Hess. Danny Hess. Yeah. <laughs> that would be funny if I was Danny Hess. But yeah, just it's immediately going for a checkmate with this pawn on g6 is a problem. Bishop g7 runs further into queen h6 check because your bishop is pinned, and I'm just going to checkmate you on g7. So Beardson is kind of the hero. Hey, Sam Copeland. Sam. Oh, Sam Copeland. Sam. Sam. I'm waiting for you to get in the chat here. But as soon as Sam Copeland gets in the chat and rook takes h7 is played, I'm telling you we're going to have a game of the week candidate. Okay, rook takes f7. Wow. Okay, white looks like he's going to mate here. I thought the queens were going to get traded off and Joshua was going to survive a little bit longer, but things took a turn for the worse and white is winning. So let's see. What is black's plan here? So queen takes g6. I guess he wants to go queen h4, and that stops the immediate checkmate on h7. 
But what's mm -hmm. definitely not stopped is if I can get my bishop to the c3 square, that would be yep. check and mate. So a move like knight to d5 continues the attack, threatening bishop c3 check, which uh, should be really problematic here. But um, Yep, and knight d5 also stops any defensive moves like rook e7. Yeah. So black is pretty hopeless in trying to defend that. He also doesn't have any threats. White's back rank mates are all protected because of the bishop pair. And well, actually, white is down material here, but it doesn't matter because black's pieces are inactive and they're just not close enough to help defend the king. Yeah, it's a what a rook for how many pawns? Three pawns. So that's already a pretty interesting material dynamic, but there must be plenty of winning moves here. I mean, bishop e3 to d4. I mentioned getting the bishop there. Can I? I can try to go. No. G3 doesn't make sense. I don't. Oh, well, maybe it does. G3 also to kick your queen, saying if you go queen h3, the only way to keep h7 protected is keeping on the h file. Then maybe I have bishop g5 and put my bishop on f6 to check. It just seems very forcing. And I hate black's position here. So if white doesn't botch this, Sam Copeland, he's there. I see him in the chat. Oh, thank gosh. We were afraid here. First Danny's gone, now Sam Copeland. Are you just going to take over everybody's roles, Robert? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always calling for... And you're for... saying machines are going to take our jobs. I just didn't realize it was happening this quick oh, and you... that there was one amongst us. You're just trying to get me in the full robot mode? <laughs> okay. Yes. I mean, you know, we can all enjoy a little bit I of... I am Robo Hess. <laughs> no, our... Uh -huh, Danny, <laughs> you're first. Our team is Robo Tez, so... That's true. So you can't replace me yet, okay? Yeah, you, you make up an equal half of this team, so I cannot Amazing. replace you. So let's uh, head on over somewhere else. Well, maybe we... do. We, should we stay here to see if Beerton finds the checkmating path here? Because, oh, he played g3. Okay. So another option that comes to mind is knight takes e4, or something like that, just opening up this bishop on b7. That's actually kind of scary. I mean, try, trying something interesting here, right? Uh, it, I mean, he, he'll probably lose if knight takes e4 and g takes h4, because after knight f2, the king can escape to g1, and there's no way the black rook can get onto e1. Right. So you can't mate with just the knight and the bishop. And I would try to give you an extra rook, Alexandra, and put it on f1, <laughs> so then knight h3 would be checkmate. That's actually a very common sacrificial checkmate idea, where yeah. knight h3 would be mate if the f1 square were occupied by another uh, rook, but it's not. So... Agreed with you. Knight takes e4, gives up the queen, and you don't have enough in return as you're just getting checkmated. Yeah. Do, 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 queen h3, play. Okay, and I'm going to quickly hover over the other games and see if, whoa. What? I found another fun game once we're done with this one. Um, okay. Between RT Francisco and Chess Flav. Okay, let's go to that. But I just saw a little repetition here between Beardson and Josh Shang, so... Okay, but yeah, so we can stay here. And no, I, I want to go to the other game. Who would you say it was again? Chess Flob? There it is. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, so both queens are under attack, and the rooks are also on the same file. So how are you going to break down this position, oh, Robo Hess? Well, I think rook takes f2 was the right decision, because pawn g6, I just take on g2 with check. Then I, so I take on g2, you have king f1, I take on e1 and then I end up up a rook. So normally, yeah. that's a great question. Like, how do you figure out these complicated positions where many pieces are hanging? Here, unfortunately, um, actually, it's checkmate. of king f1, rook f8, check and mate. But the point at large is, like, direct calculation or concrete analysis shows that black was winning. So unfortunately for uh, Richard Francisco, not his day, and Flavio Perez gets the victory. Yep. Where is... Well, that, that was a quick one, so we can go back to the game we were just looking at. Well, the board flips. Like, it just goes upside down. I'm going to have to report that little bug. Uh, okay. Where did it go? So, Bishop G5 played. Beardson. Let's go. He's always checkmating his opponent. Oh, this is nice. Okay, Bishop F6 is going to force black to sacrifice his rook. Yep. King g8. And is... now there's probably going to be a bit more repetition. Oh, he's going to queen g6 check. The king will go back to h8 and he'll play rook f5. And then the rook from f5 will come right over to h5. Yeah. That is a nice puzzle rush here. Yeah, it's, it's been hard actually because it seemed like so many options were winning. 
but there's no like direct immediate like check check mate right so right. you get a little frustrated like how do i actually win this game i know i should be winning well now the material has leveled off right black has mm -hmm. a piece for three pawns but rook f5 was just played in beerton is winning this game for sure yep um, and Greg was asking why he didn't play Bishop G5 earlier. Did you, you see him missing the opportunity to get a faster win here? No. Either way. I think he was saying Bishop G5 allowed Queen E1 check, and that's something you have to be careful about. Back on move uh, Got it. 26. Like, Bishop G5 is a tempting move, but if... Uh, I mean, actually, it's still great. No, Greg's right. I take it back. You just blockade. I forgot my Bishop and Rook both protect F1. So, yep. The white pieces are just overprotecting the back rank here. Yeah. No, Greg's right. I hate to say that out loud, but... Oof. Greg... It's okay. If you flip the game quick, it'll be like it never happened. Yeah. Well, Joshua Shang is really wishing that this game didn't happen because he's going down after Rook H5 check, winning the queen. You have to sacrifice that queen to stop the mate. And, well, once you're down a queen, you're going to get mate just soon after that. So Josh Shang losing. Yep. Anybody else? We have... Mamidarov. We can go back to Mamidarov okay. since it looks like he has an attack as he always does. <laughs> yeah, he does. He's put... But no, he didn't sacrifice anything crazy this time. Definitely did not do that. But, ooh, the light squares. And these pawns on f6, d6 are both backwards. So he put his queen on g4, saying if you move your bishop away from uh, this diagonal, I'll go queen e6. So bishop g6 is always meant by queen e6. But also queen f3 going after the f6 pawn. Okay, now queen e6 looks good. Right? Like, what's wrong with just bringing my queen into the game? Looks like it simply wins material. Yep, after queen e6, the pawn on d6 is attacked three times, and he's not able to protect it. So he either gives it up or tries something like d5, which is also giving the pawn for free and opening up white's knight and bishop so that's a pretty easy way for mami Darov to just finish this attack off with a material advantage yep so d5 is a way to just make sure that you're not getting checkmated right you don't want to lose that pawn f6 but yep. the ensuing trade should still be very good for white just simple e takes d5 which in turn protects the queen on e6 it looks like uh, mami Darov is certainly ahead in this one and I see someone mention another game, Kavutsky versus Kmar. Super interesting. Let's go there because Kavutsky, whoa, material imbalance. White is up a queen for two minor pieces, but that king on F2, Kavutsky's king, is definitely in harm's way. However, the simple retreat king to F1 might just seal the deal here. Oh, king G2. Ooh, why would he play that? Knight takes C1 was check. Double check. Double check, right. Double check, no. King F1 looked so good because black didn't have any checks to continue with other than knight takes H2, which lost the knight. He blundered. He really blundered here. Yeah, he did. Um, King G4 gets met by bishop F3. Yep. So he's going to lose his queen. And if he plays king H4, then bishop F6 check. Yeah. G4, and then, oh, you don't even have to play bishop f3 in that position. You could just checkmate white. So, yeah, white's losing his queen here or getting mated. Sad times here. Oh, king g4 was played. And bishop f3 check, and now Kavutsi can resign. He went from winning to losing in one fell swoop. And, I mean, king Commentator's f1. Commentator's curse. King f1 just, I'm sorry, king g2 just didn't make sense. Like, I, how do you yeah. put your king on the same diagonal as that bishop? Like, do you want to go back to that position and, and just show it one more time? Yeah, let's do that. I mean, yeah. King F1, I mean, there's just not even a check. And the queen on uh, right. E2 can go to E6 with check to pick up the rook on B3. Or queen I'm trying to figure out what he thought was scary. He probably here? thought rook B2, and he didn't see a way out because the rook on B2 threatens some mating nets. Okay, the game is over right. now. He's up a full rook, but back to that variation just to... Yep. But having queen e8 check, having those checks in the bag is a much better option than losing immediately, even if he didn't see how to continue here. Yeah, I mean, queen e8 check, king g7. At the very least, white should be able to make some kind of uh, repetition. But exactly. I, it's probably checkmate first for white. You have queen d7 check, and all hope is lost for black because your king goes up to h6, so you go queen h3 with check. King goes back to g7, I go rook e7 with check, and... Check, 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 checkmate. 
That seems pretty uh, straightforward. Endless checks until I mate you, since Black was threatening mate as well. So an unfortunate loss for Kostya Kavutsky. I don't really mind the fact that he lost in terms of, like, from his point of view, but I think he mm -hmm. should have spent way more time than 17 seconds to play King G2. He had 2 minutes and 15 seconds on the clock. His opponent had 6 seconds left. That's when you start spending uh, a minute and a half of your final 2 minutes to make sure that you're seeing everything. So bad time management at this moment for uh, Kosy Kavutsky, and so he went down in this game. But we have a couple games left. Where should we yeah. go? Um, so, okay. Uh, oh, Mamadero beat Gro Georg Meyer. We could look at that after. Um, it's an interesting endgame between John Bartholomew and Keaton Kira. Okay. Whoa. It's one of those instructive endgames. I know you're amazing at, inc at explaining these, so maybe you can let us know if you think Black can win this. I definitely think Black can win this. I think John Bartholomew is doing the perfect thing. The white pawn needs to be more advanced. Okay, actually, I don't know why he went king f6. He could have just went f4 followed by g3, but he's going to put his king to f4. Okay, that's the intention. Right. I would play rook a2 check right now. Uh, or that's that's going to be his threat, rook a2 check. I think he's going to play that. There we go. And they're both under very serious time pressure here. Yeah. Barely over 10 seconds. Um, Black put his king on f3, which is great because he is shielding himself from any checks, and now he's going to win the h2 pawn. He can protect the g4 pawn, so it's a pretty clear win for yeah. him G since he's going to have two pawns. You know, he took the pawn, but g3 was even more straightforward. Uh, mm -hmm. and said, okay, this is just easy winning, so Keaton Kiro resigns. And that's a nice win yes. for JB with the black pieces. But I... And there's one more game oh. between Andrew Tang and John Bryant. Looks like a draw to me. Just check, yeah. check, 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 check. Yep. Oh, I like that Penguin has Magnus Carlsen in his photo. Oh, that's a nice Easy. little nod to the world champion. Exactly. Yeah, this looks... Okay, um, so do you want to look quickly over the Georg Meyer and Mamyadyarov ending? I mean, we saw that he was winning a pawn, but it seemed like the queens didn't get traded off. Yep, so let's see. He went... Um, so he... He took on d5 with the pawn. Instead of trading queens, Meyer went rook d6, probably realizing the end game would be totally lost anyway. So he said, maybe if I keep the pieces on the board, I'll have a chance. But bishop e4, I moved 36, was nice by Mama Jarab saying that bishop on g6 is actually a pretty good piece. And by trading it, I make the light squares for black much more vulnerable. So he just put a knight in f5, said, let's trade those bishops. You're not getting away this time. And he won the c file with that. He wins the h7 pawn in the end here. And once yep. h7 falls, it's immediately a checkmate. So Mamajarov, you know, he's 28 Crushing 20. attack. He's kind of good at chess. I don't know if you knew that, Alexandra, but um, 28 20, that's pretty good, you know? Really? 28 20? Yeah, I guess it's not bad. Um, I'm kidding. You know, um, so, could be better. That's true, though. It could be I better. I mean, he could have Magnus in his profile picture. Oh, but I don't think he, I think he sees enough of Magnus across the board from him that he doesn't want That's probably true. Magnus anywhere near That's his little probably. avatar. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Mami Jaro is an amazing player. Um, how, what do you think his peak rating is going to be in his lifetime? Mami Jaro? Mm hmm I think he's already reached it and he's going down, unfortunately. He was at 2820 or whatever. Now he's at 2790. He had a horrible Tata Steel, Waikanze. And so, do you think he can recover? Um, I don't know. I don't want to like count anybody out, but you know, in yeah, I don't, I don't see him gaining those points back. I mean, it's really no offense towards him because there have been many players who have reached that twenty eight hundred plus. Well, not many. There's only been you know maybe a dozen in the world or so. Right. But who have reached that, like Alexander Grishuk, um, Hikaru Nakamura. Maxime Rocher Lagrave, they hit that 28 20 threshold, they went down, and then they never mm -hmm. have gotten back that high. I mean, it's a very high rating. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, we'll see. Well, at the very least, we will continue seeing exciting, aggressive games from him. He's one of my favorite players to watch because he always makes the game so interesting. So, hey, there's that. Yeah, he's definitely one of my favorite players as well. I always liked his fighting spirit. Um, that it's just, and he's just a tactical wizard, and he just has fun out there. So, yeah. I'm a, well, I'm a, okay. So the, the games have started. Yep. 
Um, I guess since they're still early, we could look a little bit at the standings. Minnesota Blizzard leading with three and a half. Oh my gosh. Whoa. That's such a good score. Whoa, I didn't even realize how well they were doing here, but. And Miami? Okay. We're I'm going to Miami. No? Maybe? I th I, that song sounds familiar. Okay, well, I mean, we don't actually have to go to it's Miami. Not, it's not by Pitbull, is it? I'm just, you know. I'm going to let you figure out the references yourself in due time, in due time. In due time. Okay. Um, but yeah, so wow. This was surprising because those teams were not doing so well in the regular division. Yeah. No, this is actually I'll pull up the overall standings as well because I have. Yeah, that. just quickly <laughs> since we have time. We have time and time is money, as they say, but boom, standings. So yes, expensive standings to see. Miami was in last place. Well, is in last place, but with their great start, they might be on the comeback trail. And they just want to get ahead of the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers so that they can not be relegated. In fact, their lineup is stronger these days. They've actually improved a lot. So we have to give them credit where it's due because, as we see on their board individual lineup, they have El Yanov, who's 2,700 plus on board one. They have Ituri mm -hmm. Zaga, who's been playing board one very frequently. He's a great player. But obviously, if you can push him down a board, especially in this Battle Royale format, where you're only playing other people on your board, it gives them much better chances to win there. And so um, with Tianqi Wang on board three and Richard Francisco on board four, they're also rounded out very well there. Yep, and, and Craig was just saying that Minnesota Blizzard is doing pretty well because they won the last Battle Royale. That is important. Um, I mean, they're fourth overall in the standings, so they are going to make it to the quarterfinals pretty solid result yep. but to not see the Chengdu oh sorry the Chengdu pandas aren't here um who was I about to say I don't know but I was surprised that the Norway gnomes aren't higher up here well no the button, no, walls. no Magnus you know it's uh it makes it a little that's bit tough true. that's true you got to tell Hammer to do better do more right you know some people got to do right. less Hammer's got to do more yeah he, he's been putting in the work that's for sure Okay, so let's take a look at some of the games. And Joe Bruin is asking where he can see the PCL rules. The website has the rules on there. There's a more detailed version, so you can definitely check that out. Yep. So this game between Seth Lee and John Daniel Bryan is you know, kind of ugly for Black, but Black's also probably doing like okay. Not, you know, not great, but at least it's uh, knight c5. You can take that bishop off b3, which is annoying on the diagonal. But are there other games? I mean, Beardson, I see he's playing. Um, he's not... Is he beating his opponent already or no, not yet? There's no checkmate yet. So Beardson against uh, DeMonte Cornet. Her position looks quite nice thus far with the white pieces. Nothing too much mm -hmm. has happened, but I would throw my knight on d5 and ask you how you're going to deal with it. Or I'd play a4 first to challenge the queenside pawn on b5 and then play knight d5. But either way, knight d5 is the move I want to play from DeMonte Cornet. Right, and Black should probably try to castle as quickly as possible in that position. But how are you going to castle? It's, uh, she played knight. Yeah, that's that's a more difficult question. I'm saying what he sh what would be nice, not what is easy to do here. What? Um, you... Maybe he can... Sorry, go ahead. I'm just looking at the current position. Yeah, yeah he can't play bishop e7. He can't fianchetto his bishop. He can't take the knight yet. I guess you could, I mean, you could take the knight on d5, allow the pawn to capture, maybe go queen to g6, and hope that you're in time, to, as you said, to develop and castle. But it still feels a little bit slow, and white can play on the queen side with a4 or c4 and things like that. So this is actually what's happened, knight d5, e5, and he's going to move his queen out towards the king side, and Cornette, she's going to uh, apply pressure over there on the, the queen side, a4, just like... Mm -hmm. Open up the position. Rookie one with the oh, rookie one is actually a very nice move as well. That is great. Um, I guess if rookie one, then the castling is possible. He can finally put his bishop to e7 and try to do it as fast as he can. Yeah, bishop e7. I guess yeah. Maybe I was going to try to move my bishop away and attack e5, but black can go d6, and perhaps the there's not going to be any sort of aggressive intentions for white, but strategically white's also doing really well. That's the thing here. Yeah. In this opening, like not only can I get aggressive and start an attack, but when I get a position like this, I have a three on two on the A and B files, and this is our A, B, and C files, I should say, and that kind of pawn majority means that if I ever play C4 and trade off 
uh, let's say I go rook c1, bishop e7, c4, take, take, something like this. And then I have the c file to work with and a two on one on the queen side, which means I can start pushing my pawns there with relative ease. Yep, I like white's position the more we look at it. And I was looking a little bit at the game between penguin and Talkras as well. Okay, so let me pull up that game. Penguin, there it is. Okay, got it? Yep. So black has overextended on his king side. It looks like both sides are preparing to castle queen side here. Can you explain a little bit of how the strategy changes when both king's castle on the queen side? Ooh, interesting question. So, yeah, you know, if both sides, and this is Matthew Cornet, that is DeMonte's husband, by the way, and so we have a husband-wife duo, but here if you castle queen side for both, then the pawn on h6 is still a target, but there's not a checkmate happening behind it. So black feels a little bit more comfortable. That said, mm -hmm. What I really like for white is that the dynamic of the position is such that your bishop on g7 is stuck behind a pawn, and my knight can start hopping around, right? So it can go to b3 to d4, or maybe just sit on the c4 square and ask you what you're up to. And whoa, a4. Now you're not castling. So I side. guess he's not castling on the queen side. Um, um, hmm. Okay. I mean, white is definitely more comfortable to castle king side than black is here since his pawns are closer to his king um playing a4 kind of tells black that it'll be much more difficult for him to castle queen side here because then white is going to get an attack right but now i want to put my queen to c5 and attack this e5 pawn i don't know if right now is the right time to do that but mm -hmm. uh I do with bishop c6 and queen c5, just getting my pieces onto better squares. Then I can castle queen side. I think the intention, right, is like if I castle queen side immediately and bishop c6 was played, if black castle queen side too soon, white would just rush with b4, b5, and, you know, yep. you got the hook over there on the queen side. Yep, the a6 hook. Yep. Okay, so he played bishop e4. That's a slow move he's repositioning his bishop on the longer diagonal here allowing white to offer up the trade here yeah he can now bring his queen out with the move robert was suggesting queen c5 yeah i definitely like Since that black move. isn't in any rush to castle here yeah in fact if the queens get traded you might even keep your king in the center on e7 and actually even if the queens don't get traded there are some moments where you do put that king on e7 and just say hey my king's ooh. Okay, so clearly black is going to try to castle uh, queen side here because queen takes e4, natural response, hitting b7, mm -hmm. protecting e5, but then black castles long. And yeah, because the bishop on d7 didn't really have anywhere set to go, and th it was natural that the bishops traded on this diagonal, but now the worst is definitely behind black, and I'm starting to like his position, actually. Right. So if you were white here, what would you do with your king? Would you prioritize attacking on the queen side or just getting your king safe? Hmm. I don't think black has... Or maybe neither of those. Yeah, I don't think white is a legitimate attack. So like b4, b5 feels just like an empty threat. I, I get what you're doing, but I think black can mm -hmm. pair it with a pretty easy way. Like, you know, if you go b4. So your idea is to go yep. to clearly to go b5 and try to open lines. But I go queen d7. And I say, okay, now I'm threatening queen take d2 check. I can go queen d3 or queen d5 to trade queens. And by playing b4, you made the pawn of c3 feel more vulnerable. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's looking pretty unfortunate for white. He doesn't have an attack, and now his a pawn doesn't make sense to be there so far. The e5 pawn is overextended. It's, it's all coming down to Alexandra. h5 I play yeah. right now for black, and I think white's already in huge trouble. And it's funny because earlier... We're looking at these pawns in h6 and g5 as weaknesses, but I'm turning them immediately into a strength. If I'm playing h5, my next move is g4. And once I go g4, mm -hmm. your e5 pawn is not going to be easy to protect. So. Yep. Um, and I got another interesting question from chat. How do you know when to push a pawn advantage? So I think what he was trying to me trying to say is when does it make sense to do moves like a4? Mm -hmm. oh. And it all depends on the pieces around your attack, if the attack is actually 
something that is going to be sound. In this case, we see that white only has a rook and a queen. And if you look at what black would reply with, then it seems like there's not enough there for an attack. Right. It's like, you know, you decide to push your pawns. If, you, when your opponent responds, it doesn't just like, oh, sorry, let me think about how to phrase it. You, when you push your pawns, you want to make sure you're not just only thinking about your own plans. By playing right. like b4, you're like, okay, if I played b4 and then I played b5 and then my opponent lets me take on a6, then I yeah. really like my position. But then we have to think, okay, I played b4. What does that change? It makes me one step closer to an attack, but it also makes right. my, my c3 pawn weaker. It also means that black has time to gather himself along the d file with queen d7 because the knight was on d2, and then even try to trade the queens. And once those queens come off, well, that overextended pawn that you talked about, Alexandra, feels more mm -hmm. vulnerable. Now, on the flip side, h5 was just played. h5, if you castle kingside, then black is ready to start making a, an attack on the kingside, potentially. But what h5 really does is go g4, dislodging the knight from the f3 square, where it protects the e5 pawn. And if g4 is to happen, then I can follow up with moves like rook to d5, or queen to g5, or queen to c5, and I'm just going to keep on hammering away at your e5 pawn that is hard to defend. Exactly. So the a4 push was not a good one. The h5 push was a good one. And the way Hess was able to see that was by looking a little bit forward into the future, figuring out what the plan was from there, but also considering both black and white's plan here. So make sure you don't have tunnel vision and you're only focusing on your idea because that's how a lot of blunders are made. Yeah, and nobody likes being stuck in the tunnel, right? If you drive a car, you hate it. If you're playing well, chess... Well, it's fun because you hold your breath, you know? <laughs> I'm not holding my breath on this game for Andrew Tang because I hate his yeah. position. Okay, so let's go to a position that you don't hate. How about Mami Jarov's game against Alexei Dreyev? Because I saw, right. I saw a knight on f5 that can go to d6, but then I noted that there's a bishop on b7 that's hitting g2, and I thought that mm -hmm. this dynamic is very interesting. And Alexandra, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, in your games, when you see this bishop on b7 and you see this move knight d6, right, that sort of, you know, forces the action here as, you know, both rooks are under attack and then the knight can take the bishop on b7 if necessary. But how do you feel when you see a position like this? The knight f5 looks scary, but that last move d4 was played to open up the bishop. Yeah, so when I see a position like this, even though I think as white, I would feel like maybe I had an attack, my pieces are really active, but I'm really afraid of that long diagonal pointing towards g2 to the point where I'm almost considering just exchanging my knight for that bishop because it's so powerful. And at least if I do trade off my knight, then the d4 pawn is going to become a target later on. Yeah, very true. And, and rook c2 was played just for that very purpose. If you take my rook on c8, you might just get checkmated down on your king side because right. I'm just fully armed yeah. and ready to take I mean, I love Mami Jaro's position here. White is going to be too preoccupied protecting g2. b2 is also hanging, so white's not even going to have time to take care of that weak d4 pawn. And that's why rook g1 was played, just to, instead of taking on b7, line the queen there in one turn, when rook g1 got a little passive. And if you move your rook from c8, then white can take this bishop. So rook to, say, I don't know, c5, you take the bishop, mm -hmm. I take the knight, and then the queen takes d4, gains a pawn, but there's still this pressure along the, the diagonal, the a8, h1 diagonal, and so I think that even if black goes a pawn down, the chances are still in his favor here. As soon as he makes love mm -hmm. to his king, the endless pressure feels very annoying. Right. Uh, I mean, the black rooks are placed in their best position here, not only are they doubled, but they're also, or sorry, the rook on c2 is also on the second rank, so it's one of the best places to be. His pieces are just so well coordinated here that it compensates for the lack of pawn. For sure, yeah. So I, I love this position for Mama Jarv. I think he's doing well. I think Drev has played the last few moves correctly, so he's been able to hold on here. But if we look back to move 20, so instead of knight, you know, if the, the knight would love to be on d4, if the knight was on d4 on move 20, white was like strategically almost winning because right. a, a knight on d4 blockades that bishop and you have a terrible bishop as any French player yep. knows well. Light square bishops behind the wall of pawns, not fun. But that's True. why... And the knight is the best blockader of pawns. Yes, 100%. Because it can jump over the pawns. But if a rook's blockading a pawn, mm -hmm. it means it can't move forward because the pawn is, is in front of it. But a knight can jump around. Right. So... 
that means that the knight is still active, even though it's doing a blockading roll versus a rook, which is now very limited in scope. Yep. So I, um, I said jump around, and I was hoping you would you know, sing the song, but... Jump around? Jump well, around, it's, yeah. It's more like just repeating jump around and... Yeah. You know, I can't do the electronic. But you can, you can start at the beginning, you know? You know, pack it up, pack it in, let me begin, and then just go yeah. with it. But all right. Something well. that's a sin. Okay. <laughs> so apparently Tian Chi Wang is playing very well. Is he? So let's check it, that oh, out. What's his username? Uh huh, huh. Who is he? Did he just win? Is he North Yard Prince? Yes, he is. Um, he beats yes, Torbjorn Ringdahl Hansen. And okay. Ooh, look at the end of that game. H4, just a little shot at the end just to go bishop g5 check and win this bishop on e7 uh totally oh, this is a really nice end game position to come to totally unnecessary because he probably could have just went d8 equals queen and been up a piece anyway but h4 seems uh well ultra precise right um i was just trying to check how tian Shi has been doing so far in the league overall yeah in the league overall um is he in the league of his own he might be with this ending, but let's let's take a look at some of the games that are still going. All right, so where should we go? Take me to the best game in the round. Is it um, John okay, Bartholomew? What about... Yes. There we go. You read my mind. By the way, Georg Meyer did just beat Gawain Jones. That's a nice victory for Meyer. A nice rebound after losing to Mamajara. But right now we're talking Flavio Perez, who won that nice game in the first round, where he checkmated his opponent. We saw like the queens were hanging but he had the better side of it. Now we're in an unclear position where both kings feel like they're in danger. Alexandra, what's your gut instinct telling you here? All right, well, my gut instinct needs to analyze the position a little bit first. So let's see. It looks like white is technically up a pawn, so he has material advantage on his side. Yep. Um, black has three pieces attacking the king here. The queen is blocked off, so not really able to help. On the black king side, white has one queen towards it and the rook on the open file. Woof, king it's, d2. It's, it's unclear. It's unclear. Um, I don't see a crushing blow for either side here. I think the fact that black has his knight closer to black's king is very tricky. Mm -hmm. But there's, and he's also able to grab back the pawn on a2 if he wants. So the material is going to be even there. Yeah, but I do love this move by John Bartholomew because what he's doing, King D2 is like, wait, aren't you just putting your king in more danger? No. He's allowing his rook to go to B1, or if you take on A2, my rook can go to A1, and I'm trading off some of the rooks because with the king on C1, I can't actually dislodge these rooks. Like, the knight on A4 was hanging, but so was the knight on E2 behind it, and the rooks are getting mm -hmm. scary. So King D2 is a nice move, knight C5, and now he can play rook to B1 and start trading off these right. rooks and say, well... Alexander counted correctly, whites up a pawn, so that pawn is the A pawn, and in any end game, an A pawn is really annoying to deal with as it's all the way on the flank. For sure. If John Bartholomew can trade off and defuse the attack a little bit, then he's just left with a pawn up, and that's a big advantage for him in an end game. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, Kosha Kavutsi has gone down again. That's his second straight loss. He oh, blundered that winning sad. position earlier, and now he suffered defeat. And Eltal Safferly beat John Daniel Bryant. Oh, my gosh. Let's go there for just a second because there's a checkmate on the board, and that is not fun at all. He just got <gasps> mated on a That six. is a beautiful mate. I don't think I've seen a checkmate like this ever. Like, this is just ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I wonder where this crushing attack started. Uh, let's go back then. Well, the king went to g5, and in the first battle royale of today's action, the first battle royale of today's action, today's first battle royale, Conrad Holt got his king checkmated on d4, like all the way in the center, and here this king on g5 got in trouble quite quickly, and he went h5, and once black went h5 and moved 34, well, you're trading off your isolated pawn, but you're just actually putting your king in trouble, because what... Right. What Eltal Safferly did was perfect. He just put his rooks on the g-file, and then he delivered the check and mate. So, too bad. Yeah, he opened up his position a little bit too much there. 
Yeah. Okay, who is still playing some interesting games? I mean, this this Bartholomew game is interesting. There's definitely more interesting games. Uh, this game between Maze, Mazetovich, I'll, I'll pull that one up, and Fidel Corrales. Okay. Whoa, so Maze has three pawns that are passed. Yep. So his only issue here is a potential attack. Uh, that being said, his queen is protecting the g2 square, so that's not an issue. Yep. Mm, black doesn't look like he can sack on g3, because after knight takes g3, h takes g3, queen takes g3, the king just escapes to h1. Yep. Okay. So unless black has some interesting idea here that I haven't seen just yet, white should be winning. I completely agree, and it's important to realize why this g3 move was good is just it attacks the queen and you're saying you can go ahead and sacrifice but my ex in there he does go ahead and sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, but it's just yeah not good enough here right yeah I, at least he was able to get two pawns for the knight um but even though the white king has no pawns next to him the queen is doing most of the protective work and black is going to be occupied trying to stop those past pawns absolutely and by the way, Soggy Cheese, who's been a great performer all year, just beat Keaton Kira. So that's an upset. It's Vinesh wow. Ravuri. And he beat Keaton Kira. That's a, what, 300 and plus point upset? Yep. Right. But let's not forget that uh, Ravuri has been performing at least 2250. So. Yeah, he's, he's a boss. He has been killing it this season. And by it, I mean his opponent's <laughs> positions. Whoa, what happened? In, I'm looking at this game between uh, Cornette and Beardson. We looked a long time ago, and I loved White's opening, but something has gone really wrong. That Rook is trapped. It's going to be forced off the board. And once the Rooks get traded, well, Cornette is down two. Nope, make that three pawns. And down three pawns in a hopeless position. They're not finding love in this hopeless place. I was hoping you would do that. You're so... I got you. I got you. Yeah, I'm so happy right now. I was already just feeling like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm going to lob it up there for her. It's going to be a softball pitch. And then you just, <laughs> you nailed it. So We communicated that one. We well. did. Let's go to a different game because there's too many extra pawns in this one. Lots of rook end games going on, it seems like. Uh, Whoa. Mama Jarov is even. Well, nope. Yeah, even a material, but whose pawns are faster? Isn't Black just winning now? Wasn't he always much better off here? He was, but that decision a couple moves ago for Drev to take on f6 seemed strange to me. I thought he'd bring his king over the queen side and try to defend that way, but instead he took the f pawn, and well, I mean, it's just too little too late. He would love to rush his h pawn down the board, but it's very easy for Black to go rook b2 check. Pawn a2, pawn b3, rook b1. It's about to happen here, 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 game over. The h pawn is not quick enough. Oh, rook b3, check to a3, even better. Nice. That's a nice way to finish it. Resignation has occurred. Mama Jarv wins. Rook b3, check. And then once I get rook a3, I block your rook from protecting the promotional square. And, well, that's a done deal. Yep, that's how a lot of rook end games can be won if you figure out some way to help protect the square where your pawn is going to promote without losing the pawn that needs to promote. You should be good. Yep. And that is winning for Mama Jarva. Nice victory for What you. about Penguin's game? He's also in a rook end game. Um, he's down a pawn, but he seems like he's going to hold a draw here because he has a ton of checks. And if the white king, the black king gets too far, then white can start putting pressure on f7, which can't be pushed because if it's traded off, it's also a draw. Yeah. The white king. Oh, I, I thought he was going to hold the g file, but I guess he has perpetual, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, he's a keep check and then put back the rook, the rook back down. And yeah, that's a big problem. Is f7 pawn is a backwards pawn. So, oh, rook g5. This is a, a little bit of progress. For king g6, play rook g4 check. Ne oh, no, you can't play rook g. Oh. So, where's his king going? I mean, Tang is just blitzing this out because it's easy for him. He has a very concrete plan. Just keep... Oh, his king was cut now. So rook g1, I guess, at some point. You let the king go to g7, then play rook yeah. g1. Yeah, but... And we don't like seeing the king cut like this because then he can't help protect the pawn on e5 as easily anymore. Again, we're not saying that it's not a draw anymore. It's just a little bit more tricky for white. Yeah, for sure. And drawn by agreement because this rook is attacks the f7 pawn. 
your rook on c4, it cannot simultaneously attack the pawn on e5 and cut off the king. That's very important. What black needs right. to do is attack e5. But by playing rook c5, you now allow my king to go back to e4. So you're not able to attack and cut off the rank. So unfortunately for Cornet, he has to agree to a split point. Okay, and that was the last game of this match. Yep. So this was our third match. We got five more. Yep, I pulled up the uh, individual scoreboard just now to see how everyone is doing. We have Ma Minnesota Blizzard still up top. Yep, they're up top. We have Mamid Jarab and Vinesh Ravuri for the Hackers with two out of two. Eltash Safali, one and a half. And Kavutsky, he had that win in the bag against Vincent Keimer. He unfortunately let it slip out of his hands, and Keimer uh, struck gold in that position with the tactics working in his favor. So, Oh, sorry, second round. Yes, this was just the second round. But, okay, so Minnesota. We're going into the third round, I meant to say. Yep, Minnesota led by Beardson. You're 0% surprised, I know. I, I mean, every time we look over there, he's checkmating. Beardson. Beardson. Yeah, Minnesota Blizzard, board three and four, doing better than their top two. Yep. But that's more or less expected because Minnesota has a very even lineup, right? They have t low 2,500, uh, I think nearly 2,500 in Tang, 2,470 in Beardson. 24 50 or so in bartholomew so they spread the rating wealth whereas if you look at a team like the hackers mom is 2820 vinesh ravuri is 2050 but vinesh ravuri is just a monster that is hard to deal with so he is performing well above his rating and actually the surfers at only one and a half points is really disappointing frankly well i forgot to ask you before these games started who is on your fantasy team for today. And now you have a bit of an advantage because you can tweak it to the results that ha you've already seen. But if you picked your fantasy team before knowing that, I'd love to hear okay. what it was. I'll tell you. Mama and Ma thanks, Dave Chess, for the 100 bits cheering in chat. Hey, and, th and hey to David Chess, who just said hi to me there. So we're, we're reading the chat. Um, just to everyone know that if we don't uh, get to your message, it's not because we're ignoring you, but of course, we're trying to multitask here. But let me get pull up my fantasy team. Okay. Um, Mama Jara, board one. Safar Lee, board two. Vincent Keimer, board three. And John Bartholomew, board four. That's my team. Okay. I just pulled up the. John e Bartholomew doing very well. Who is your board three again? Uh, Vincent Keimer, the youngster from Germany who has one out of two. Pretty decent Got result. Got it. And, and your board two? My board two is Safar Lee, and my board one is Mamajarov because they're the highest rated players yeah. in their boards, and they're just awesome at chess. Yeah, well, you picked pretty well so far, um, and it's still early for Vincent Kamer, so let's see how he does this round. Vincent, Vincent, no? Okay. Yes, Bishop H6. Mamajarov's rating counts as 2,700 towards the team average, but we still show his actual rating. Yep, and Face Chess is telling us the lineup, that they chose for the matchup. Georg yeah, Meyer, let us know who you guys picked as well. Andrew Tang, Justin Tan, and John Bartholomew. Do you think he's enough syllables on his last name? I think we could add a couple more. Yeah, Bartholomewovich. Maybe make it a poem with his name. I like Bartholomew. <laughs> yeah, I know, bitch. <laughs> the son of Bartholomew. His dad's name is Bartholomew Bartholomew. No. Bartholomewovich sounds like the name of a baby born between American and Russian royalty to foster peace between the two countries. Wow, look at you getting all diplomatic. I uh, did study international relations. It comes to my head more often than it should. <laughs> anyway, um, so the games have started. Yep. Okay, so let's see. Which game? Do we, so I have Mama Jarvis game against Sebastian Maze up here, but there are many more games that we can get to. We've seen a lot of Mama Jarv, so if we want to share maybe some Minnesota games and some Miami games, because yeah. I have a feeling that San Jose is here to stay, which means we'll be looking at them more towards the final rounds of the uh, Battle Royale. So take me where you choose. <laughs> John will bring us world peace. That's so cute, the little emotes. Let's look at Klein Beer and Nordyard Prince. Klein Beer, that is Mr. Beardson. Yeah. And if you're wondering, I didn't shave, I'm sure everybody noticed. It's because I knew that Beardson would be playing. And, well, I wanted to be a beard friend instead of a beard son. 
So, you, you know, come on, give me a, a little chuckle, maybe something, a little bit, nothing. Oh, I was just reading chat. Otherwise, I would have laughed very hard. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got temporarily distracted. If I'm not laughing at your jokes, it's not because they're not funny. It's because chat distracted me. It so really wasn't funny. That out of the way. It, it wasn't funny at all, just for the record. Like, you shouldn't have laughed. But if you laughed, I would have been like, okay, now I know when she laughs another time, it's not real. And that's all that I want. Okay. All, all I want is the truth. Well, sometimes I laugh at you, not with you. So, you know. It could work both ways. Yeah, I mean, you should laugh at me. I deserve it all the time, especially when I'm pulling a little bit of the Danny wrench because he was going to commentate with you and I knew you were expecting it. You probably, in your mind, were gearing up for it. And then last second change happened. I have to do the double, double dip in on the commentary today. And um, well, okay, that's such as life. But we have this game that you pulled up here, you told me to pull up, between Beardson and Tianqi Wang. And yep. these players are both 2-0, if I'm not mistaken. And these teams are tied for first. The champions and the Blizzard have five and a half out of a possible eight. So, yep. you, I'm very close game between the two. Close off position. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate positions like this? I would... Obviously, the pawn structure is a lot more important since it shapes the position more. Yep. So, G6 was played to get, instead of leaving the position to be so close, to break it open. And, Important to this position is both sides have a pawn on their fifth rank. This f5 pawn is on white's fifth. This d4 pawn is on black's fifth, right? The fourth and fifth ranks. But black's pawn is very well cemented on d4, whereas white's on f5. If you go g4, maybe black plays h5 and just continues to um, open up the position. Yep. Um, if he plays h5, h3 wouldn't work to defend the g pawn because... White can't take back since his rook would be under attack. Yep. So White would have to reply with something else after h5. Maybe he'd be forced to take on g6, but that opens up the bad bishop on c8, which yeah. looks like it was closed off to g4. So things are looking very good for Black here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that this bishop. Is the correct way to open up the position. That bishop looking free at last over there. So that would not be. Um, Freedom! Yeah, you know, it's like when you're just stuck in a box for a little bit, that bishop's in a cage behind the white pawns, that um, it would be nice to get out of it and to, you know, h5 is the right way. You just kind of keep chiseling at the pawn base, and very important, and mm -hmm. es actually essential here, is white is not in time to play h3. Because the rook on yep. h1, you before you make a move like h3, protecting your pawn, you need to make sure your rook is protected. So after pawn g4, if you take back on g4 with the pawn, then you lose your rook on h1. So your, your bishop needs to be on right. g2 before you make a move like that. Yeah. This position actually reminds me a lot of the queen's gambit declined when white plays d4, black plays d5. Because in those positions, often white never wants to push their pawn all the way to c5, similar to how white pushes pawn to f5 because you can really chip away at that overextended pawn structure. Although, white just managed to get an attack, so maybe it's working... Oh, I think it's because black made a mistake so let's on see. move 13, so... So you see, ah, you wouldn't have taken on f5, is what you're saying? No, I wouldn't let the knight get onto f6. That's terrifying. I am a, a afraid player, so I would have played knight g8 to stop that. Look at you, finding the backwards moves. I like that, just stopping knight f6. And maybe actually if we take it one step yeah. back, that means h takes g4 probably, you know, you could have played bishop d7 and just left the mm -hmm. tension on the king's side. We talk about this a lot, right? You make a trade when it favors you. But you just, right. you know, you showed us that the knight's coming to g4 and to f6. That scares me. Let me play bishop d7. Yes. Let me castle queen side. Then I can figure out what to do over there on the king's side when we start opening up files, right? We can open up the h file and the g file and things like that. So uh, definitely. Yeah, I, I like bishop d7 as well. I'm a big fan of getting my king to safety as fast as I can, especially if I have the time for it. So I like the plan you pointed out. Yeah. And now knight g5 threatens mate in one. Knight takes f7 would be checkmate because my knight on f6 covers d7 and e8. Your queen's on c7, your knight's in e7, so your king is boxed in by its own pieces. So here I would just play bishop e6, just developing my bishop, saying, giving my king a square on, the, on c8 to work with. And of course, mm -hmm. from e6, my bishop protects f7. So yeah, yeah, interesting game thus far. I mean, maybe white's attack isn't sound, but 
I still think the idea of being a little bit more careful careful earlier on is a more precise way to play this position and just make sure that you could have get, gotten your king safe first. Right, and that's, you know, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see because a bishop e6 was played. So you said safe and sound, honestly, and I really wanted this thing build you up. And I was like, ah, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to hold back. But there's another good song called Safe and Sound. But anyway, um, I just took a quick look at Safarli and Cornette's game. You got to go there. You won't be disappointed. I suggested it. I won't be disappointed. Where Unlike is... Unlike that one time I suggested a Petra. Wait, where's the game? Oh, there it is. Wait, no, wrong. Tokras and Eltash. Safarly. There it is. Okay. Oh, because there are two Cornettes. I went to the De Monte Cornettes. You're going to have to specify... Right. Sorry. You're right. You're right. It's hard when we have a married couple playing. Yeah, it is. It makes it difficult for sure. Okay. Whoa. What's going on here? So it's actual attack for both sides potentially. Actual yep. attack potentially. I need to think before I speak so I don't talk, sound like that. But well, I mean, Black has an actual attack because his pieces are very coordinated. The queen and the rook pointing towards the king. The two pawns on the fourth rank. Maybe you could explain a bit about how white has an attack as well. Yeah, the problem with... Well, actually what you're saying is very relevant to what I'm about to say is that because the queen is on g6 and not, say, on b6, now all of a sudden mm -hmm. queen c2 threatens mate in one. And queen c2 right. actually here is just winning because queen c2, I'll give you my rook. You take... Queen c2 oh, played. No. Take my rook. This is so nice. Yeah, so this is going to be... Uh, on the board, bishop c1, rook c1, king b8, the only way to escape from the mate, but queen c7 check, move your king to the a file, and then I take your bishop. I have won two minor pieces for just one rook, and that is a great trade for Matthew Cornette. And you can't play c6, they'll just take you and rip open your king. And so what you were saying, where black looks like he's got his pieces ready to go for a kingside attack, but no pieces to protect the king. And on the other side, white has this knight on f1, which is always kind of holding things together here. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, nice play by Matthew Cornette. He's just ripping through Elta Safali's defenses. Yeah, and Bishop H6 looked like such a natural move. You're trying to attack the C1 squared and not get mated, but unfortunately it didn't hold up. And to answer Joe's question about White, who is Matthew Cornette, he is playing on the same team as his wife. Yes. They're both on the... The bl Kane's blitz streams. Yeah, they represent the blitz streams. Queen takes c7 check, bishop takes d7, and then this is a world of hurt for Safar Lee. And just, you're up too much material. g3, a bit of a desperation here. But now the thing is, like, if I play bishop c6, I probably checkmate you. But let's say I play calmly, I can just take this pawn on g3 twice, and you're not mating me. So I'm perfectly happy right. to do that. And what would you recommend? that people who are starting to play chess would do here? Bishop c6 or h takes g3? Because they're both good moves, just very different strategies. Um, well, if bishop c6 leads to like a forcing variation, I would do that. In fact, it does. Because bishop c6, if you play rook b8, I play queen to b6, threatening queen takes a6 checkmate as my bishop pins the pawn on b7. I remember when I said, if you're starting, <laughs> so you have to imagine, I guess you'd have to calculate out the entire variation. Um, well, the point I was trying to make is sometimes in rapid games when you're starting to pick up the game, it's easier to defuse an attack first and then beat your opponent right. than calculate out an entire line. But obviously, if you're a, a super human like Robert, you should do the most precise one. Well, no, I'm actually going to agree with you, and especially because we're talking about quicker time controls. Like, Let's say it's, it got even lower in the clock, so you're playing Blitz. Yeah. You can just, you realize that this configuration is great for white, you're up material. So if I just mm -hmm. take this pawn on g3, I know my bishop always can retreat to h3 to close off that file. And so I can just mm -hmm. sit on the position and gain a little bit of time on the clock and then figure out how to go forward. So you're absolutely right. You have to weigh those options. Sometimes it's just pure calculation. Other times it's like, let me just make sure everything is um, safe and sound, like you said before, and then make progress accordingly. Okay. I'll, I'll take that. And uh, Guy and Jones is missing a queen. <laughs> Wait, so Verde not. where is your game? Who are you playing? Uh, against uh, Alexi Drev. Okay, got it. Um, I, I think um, where did he's that... missing a queen. So yeah, black is definitely better here. You want you go back material to material wise. Go back to move um, 12. And this is why he's oh. missing the queen. 
So white went bishop g5. Black took this knight on e2, thinking, uh, Gawain was thinking he'll win the rook on e8, which he did, but unfortunately for him, winning this rook got his queen trapped. And so he ended up getting two rooks for a queen and a knight. And a queen, yep. two rooks for a queen is great. Two rooks for a queen and a minor piece is very bad. It's a bad deal for you. So um, Gawain Jones got the raw deal, and Alexey Dreyev should win this game quite easily. He's going to put his knight on e4 mm -hmm. next, and then go for the f2 pawn. The g3 pawn is also going to be hanging, so everything is a problem. Yeah. yeah, so we often see poisoned pawns in openings where it looks tempting because the pawn is hanging, but if you take it, your queen will get trapped. This was a poisoned rook. So always be sure to, to see if your queen has a way out before grabbing that piece. For sure. So let's um, see, who else can we go to? Well, what about Soggy Cheese? He's Soggy been playing very cheese. well. Playing Between Chess, chess Flav. Flav and Soggy Cheese. All right, yeah. so my first question, Alexandra, is like, can I make this, okay, a queen e2. But I'm always mm -hmm. wondering when can I go e6 as white, just to like break open right. the position to ruin Black's kingside pawn structure. Uh, he, there he goes. He answered my question. He goes e6. I yeah. don't love it as much as I did before. In fact, if we go back to move queen to e2, okay. I move 32. Instead of mm -hmm. queen to e2, I would have considered queen to a2, keeping my eye on the f7 square so that when I take on g5, now f7 is hanging. So instead, in the game right. continuation, he went queen e2. But this has led to a series of trades where it's an e oh, rook e8 check, be careful, or rook takes g6, also be careful. Mm -hmm. So why do you go king g2? It seemed totally unnecessary. And he played it very quickly as well, as if he was afraid of some check that does nothing. Um, yeah, because rook e8 check forced bishop f8, and then I want to play a move like knight e6, winning the bishop on f8, but the problem is you have king to f7 attacking both rook and knight. So. However, I take on f8, you'll take with the piece. You'll take the piece that didn't capture the bishop, and so then black would escape. Right. I, I just can't stop looking at rook e8. I'm curious if there's any way that white can use his rook and knight to pin the bishop here. That's the obvious right scary threat as long as he yeah rook doesn't a forget about the pass pawn. Rook a6. So that way your rook is very far away. So now rook a8 check mm -hmm. is a threat because once you go right. bishop f8, now I have knight e6. So uh, this actually is pretty well done, I think, by Flavio Perez. Now I'd go f4, then I'd go f5. Can you guess what I would do after I go f4 and f5? Um, so if you'd play f4 I'm saying, well, and f5? Yeah, what's my next move going to be for white? Um, so there's no mate, is there? No, but uh, that's why I said f4, I said f5. f4, f5, f6. Yeah, there you go. Then what's going to happen after f6? Then he's getting a checkmate on the back rank. Yeah, then I'm going to go f7 if you stop my checkmate, and then I'm going to get a queen. Yeah. So I, I guess my point is that this f pawn feels pretty unstoppable at the moment. Um, you know, the white has two pawns on the king side over here. Black has this a pawn, which is really annoying because my rook has to stay behind it. But what are you doing with it? Like, if you go a3, I can just start going my king to g4, then my king to f5, right. then my king to g6, and then f5, f6, etc. So it's looking yeah. very nice here. Oh, there you go. He's taking your idea. His king is also on g4, so he doesn't have to worry about any checks here. Yeah. Yep, chat knows. F6. Good job, BJ, Sherlock, Scott Smith. They all get it. They get it. They get it. And they, they say that, you. and they say that you type very fast, which is true. You do type it very is fast. True, yeah. You're a quick go, 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 go. How many words per minute, you know? I actually haven't done that test. I'm slower on this keyboard than on my laptop, but still pretty fast you know yeah no i mean it definitely sounds like it i hear just like furiously typing always and i'm just like i, I don't know <laughs> oh, what to say king g6 looks so nice here yeah I'll... just going for that back rank i mean he can stop it obviously with rook c8 and then what's going to happen after rook c8 i promise you i've said this move before are you talking again about f5 and f6 oh yeah i am so f5 right now is good the a pawn is stopped in its tracks Right, because the rook on a6 covers the a2 square and it's not protected. Yeah. So just play f5, and again, go f6, and you're threatening checkmates, your pawn is threatening to promote. So I know I'm repeating it many times, and there's f5, but it's partially a joke, but there's a lot of sincerity behind it in what I'm saying, because when you have these two pawns on the king's side, I think Flavio Perez did a great job getting his king in front of the pawns. That way, it could be used as support. 
And mm -hmm. here, F6 check. Okay, he went 94, but F6 check felt, oh, okay, I think what he was worried about, as I think now, F6 check, bishop F6, and if rook takes F6, A2 happens, and all of a sudden, I can't stop you from getting a queen. So that is why Flavio Perez went 94 first, because yep. now he can always recapture on F6 with a knight. But don't do it now, because F6, bishop F6, knight F6, you lose the G3 pawn, and that's going to be rook and knight versus rook, and that is a theoretical draw. So rook A7 check played first, and he's now F6 works because when I recapture F6, it's a check. So F6 is now time. There is. And I just wanted to call attention because there's two very interesting games I've seen. So Beard's scene, as usual, is crushing his opponent. But also Fidel Corrales and Pavel Eljanov have a very interesting position. So between the two, you should probably take a look before they end since both players are on, in time pressure. Okay, so Beard's in completely winning. He just picked off a knight on A5, threatening queen B7 yep. check. Resignation occurs. Let's go over to Fidel Corrales versus El Whoa. Yep. You're like, I was going real fast, and I'm like, wait, Elyanov looks great here with the black pieces. King is a little iffy, but two pawns are too, too many to it do it. It looks scary at first on move 27 with his king on g8, the open g file, but he was able to quickly get cover behind the pawns, and now his king is actually safe. Yeah. He... Whereas white's king is not in the same story. No, I mean, the king on A4 check, throwing that check. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can play... Such a nice move. He can't take it because uh, he opens up the A file. Yeah. So can you just go ahead and take on D4? That's a question. Maybe just king D7 to C8 and try to reach safety. But queen takes D4 also seems very, very good here. Just take a pawn, attack a knight, threaten the king. Just, I think it's pretty hopeless for Fidel Corrales. Elyanov just too strong here yeah yeah that 2700 magic though <laughs> but do you believe in magic uh do you yes that's a song everybody should right i'm just wondering whoa what about the mamidarov game i think mamidarov is gonna lose no is way he he's not getting no, he's not getting mated. For a second, I thought bishop e4, king h2, rook h1. But, of course, after bishop e4, he can block the check. Yeah. Ideally with the pawn, so he doesn't give his rook up. That's actually a great thing to keep in mind, though. And I like that you said that with bishop e4 check. You have to go f3, because that mate that you just pointed out is uh, potential to be on the board. But maybe black has gained something by opening the second rank. Now you have more <laughs> checks, so you can go rook e2 with check to force the king to the first rank. And that kind of thing right. is very beneficial. But d6 is falling. Once d6 falls, c5 falls. And I think it's pr pretty hopeless for um, Sebastian Mazet here. Not to mention that white can flip the script as well by rook e3 and bishop h6 at some moment to try to deliver a checkmate of his own. Yeah, yeah. So it looks scary for a second. But no, Mamed Yarov just fought off that defense. Now he's grabbing the two pawns he's going to promote. So yeah, he's... Yeah. Uh, He's too good. Not very nice conversion here. So Ch um, Chess Flob just beat Soggy Cheese. We were looking at the game earlier. Who mm -hmm. else? Keaton Kira, Keaton 87, playing Poobel. Uh, well, actually, okay. maybe... No, this... this Poobel? Doesn't that mean trash can in French? That's questionable <laughs> use of the name, but that's okay. Yeah, I want to get off this game with your mom and Jarv just because the two pawns are just start pushing themselves. C5, yeah, C6, sure. King C5. This is how you do it. So you'll we'll just watch for half a second more. C6 is coming, the king C5, and D6, and push your way home. But uh, let's go over to that game with Pooh Bell. Where is that? There it is. Because what is going on here? So would you say her position is in the Pooh Bell? Um, I can't tell. <laughs> okay, I, that would have been great if it if it worked. Like, um, okay, Queen C7. That was a that was a good move, probably. It or looks actually, like a good move. Wait, but, but Queen A was a great response. Right, because now Queen A1 is coming. Oh. I don't think, I think Queen C2 was a move that looked good, but is actually bad. Yeah, because Queen C7, you're like, oh, trade queens, please. If you trade, right. then all of a sudden I have a passed pawn that you're not stopping. So I just totally yeah. forgot that Queen A8 could happen, and then here comes Queen. Oh, man. Is Keaton Kira just going down? He can't block. Oh, he can. He has to, I guess. He's to put something on D1. Oh. Rook D1, but doesn't he just lose? Ah, you... but if Bishop takes, F7 is no longer protected. Exactly. So maybe 
something to d1. I don't know if rook or bishop is better, because rook d1 forces a trade of the rooks. Because rook d1, right. you would love to take with the bishop, but queen f7 check happens, and then this king is feeling very uncomfortable. So r bishop d1 was played, and now we see a trade. Okay, queen takes d1. Um, okay, so hang now... Hang on, I feel like white is in serious trouble with his king side. Uh, I didn't like I didn't Whoa. like this. Why didn't he move the knight to h? Why didn't she move the knight to h5? Yeah, knight h5 was definitely better because that's what I was afraid of because it it was then knight h5, knight g3, queen h1. Oh, Oof. checkmate coming on the board. She missed it. Um, yeah, I think she got scared about her king, which makes sense, right? That's kind of understandable. Yeah. But now what's happening? We have even material. Both kings are feeling under pressure. Um, under pressure. Yeah. You keep going. I'm, I want you to keep singing. Yeah, but but chat doesn't, so I stopped it there. All right, fine. Okay. Uh, so what is? Oh, okay. So there's a perpetual, but I think White has the attack here. Although now White has to be careful about b6. So maybe this exciting game is just going to end in a draw with the time pressure on both sides. Queen takes h4. So threatening knight g5. Uh oh. But knight g5 doesn't have a mate because the bishop on b3 very important. Wait, wait, wait. It protects. Oh, okay. It protects f7, right? That was the that was a yep. key, ugh, key moment. Key move here. And e6, I can always put queen c7 check. With key. Wait, why is she not putting her king on d7? The king on d7 is safer. She... I think she was afraid of losing the pawn since the king protected f7. Yeah. With the bishop. She offered a draw, by the way, and Keaton said no. But now she's better. Yeah. And Keaton is much lower on time, so. King c7. All right, so three pawns. Um, Wait. But black has a pass pawn, so um, that's important. This is very important. And so the way to draw is sacrifice your knight for the c pawn and trade off all the king side pawns. But right. I don't know if black. So king b6, knight d7, king b5. Why is she? So she's moving her king backwards when she. c5. I mean, she's the one who should be playing for a win here. c4. Chess got talent. Oh, that's that's hilarious. Okay. Um, King c5. Black's moves are this actually is quite not good. White White's knight on b4 is just bishop helping b4. Black's king get closer, which is what he already wants. No, to do. she went bishop e6. She just went bishop e4. She she I think she's a little bit nervous. Okay, h5 just wins now for White. So she is definitely nervous. She just blunder that. Yeah. She forgot. To... Bishop f5 doesn't work. Oh my gosh, this is so sad. I think she's realizing that she can't stop the H pawn anymore. Yeah, she um, she got nervous. Really, that's what happened. She had a great opportunity to. She was fighting really well, honestly. That was good defense. And then all of a sudden, she just collapsed in a critical moment. Here, I move seventy three black. Knight to C two happened. This pawn, of course, wants to start pushing down the board. But Bishop E four hits the knight on C two and covers the diagonal once white goes h5. So bishop e4 move 73 would have uh, done the trick because now my c pawn is pushing and you're going to have to sacrifice your knight for it and my king can just go to d4 and win e5. So huge yep. opportunity missed for uh, Pubel. So I don't... Aw, she didn't play coward chess fork down. Um, she, she was under a lot of pressure. Yeah, no, this is very tough, but she should have spent more time. Yeah. Yeah, she should have. It's just hard because when your opponent plays quickly, you also have the reflex to do it. So sometimes, without thinking, you also start playing faster, but you bring up good points. So let's look at the last game My between Vincent Kamer. Vincent! Vincent Kamer and Vincent Masuka. At least that's what their usernames are. Whoa. In case you guys are confused. I was very confused. I was like, who's that? And then I see what you're saying. No, no. That's what um, Hansen has his username as. Got it. So take on h8, take on h8 okay. in response. So we'll get an end game, which is winning for white. Cut off the king. Play rook, exactly, rook f8. Yep. And so what white is going to do is go king c5. Yep. And then sacrifice the rook for the pawn and bishop. So rook to b8 at yep. any moment. Exactly. Here, rook b8, and take the pawn. it's important to note that this position is winning for white because of black's king position. If the black king was closer, then that may have been a draw. But when the king is that far away, you get your king to the sixth file, then you just keep pushing. doesn't matter who has the move to play in that position. You're winning as white. Yep. Vince. All right. That's bad for my fantasy team. 
I know you did say Kamer was on your team, but the rest of your fantasy team has been doing well. Finns uh, or Bartholomew won again. Mami Jarov won again. Ah, gotta get hydrated. Just drink some water. Um, yeah, that's that's good. Sefer, Sefer Lee got crushed though, so that wasn't good for my team. Um, Kamer, Kamer only has one out of three. Bartholomew and Mama Jarv, they're doing work for my team though, so I appreciate they that. They are. So let's let's I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat because I sometimes overlook what people are saying. Good end game. Somebody said my audio is out of sync. Hopefully it's better now. You guys can let me know. Um, Joe Bruin liked that end game. Shout out to Joe Bruin for gaining about a hundred points in Blitz recently. That's awesome. We like to see you guys improving at chess, hopefully. Listening to Teacher Hess helps you with some of that. Well, I know. I've mixed that. Emo- I pick up things. Well, I have mixed emotions about them getting better at chess. On one hand, I'm happy that they're listening to us and getting better. On the other hand, I don't want them to get too good so they don't need us anymore, and then they're like hypercritical of everything that we say. So you know what I'm saying? We need like that middle ground where they're getting better, but at a, yeah. like a linear See, rate. That, that's why I tell them to play the French defense. That's my secret attack. Bad advice. Are you trying to get me to leave as your co-commentator? <laughs> I'm just joking. It hurt though. The joke it just it pierced me. Like I, I'm emotionally vulnerable when the French is being discussed, and that's true. I'm also disgusted. That's the secret to making Robert emotional. Yeah, it just it hurts so bad. I honestly have passwords, and I should, you know I know you should never say any of your passwords, but I've had passwords in the past. Yes. Stop! Shh, shh, shh. Don't! No! 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 Don't say stuff about your past. No! 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 This, they're old passwords. I hate the French. No, actually, I used to have something like that, um, but obviously, I changed that because you know I'm doing commentary with you. You got older than thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, don't hate me. Oh my gosh. Um, but wow, uh, Mami Jarov has three out of three. Thomas Bearden, Beardson has three out of three. And. Your fantasy team is also doing very well. It's doing okay. It's, you know, it could be better. My advanced ad- analytics, they just were out of sync today because, yeah, you know, I can't be a robo 24-7. That's fair. That's fair. Um, can you explain why the French defense is played? Because to me, it's losing for black because white has the pawns further than black. Love it. Love the question. Well, Hikaru plays some fun French games. Just saying. Anyway, the games have started. We can move on from this conversation where one player is clearly wrong. Oh, Forktown. That's a good point. Hey. I learned from Hess, don't use engines and pay attention to wrong color bishops. And then he's gained 200 online rating points. Very good. Yeah. Hess, what is your recommendation for people who are, say, under 1,600, under 2,000 on using en- engines? I mean, my recommendation in general is never use engines because there are some issues in general. So like Mm -hmm. when you use an engine, you have the answer in front of you. And like when you're analyzing a game, for example, if I just, if I turn on the engine, which I never use when I commentate, I can see that, okay, this is the best move, but I'm not Mm -hmm. actually going to be able to find it myself necessarily. It's the same reason why with some of the people that I work with and okay, admittedly they're master level players, I don't give them puzzles. So when you do tactics trainer on chess.com, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And when you do puzzle rush, which is amazing. Uh, but to a certain degree, it, it, it helps train your um, tactical abilities and your vision and things like that. But if a real game is happening, nobody's telling you, I'm not poking you on the shoulder being Alexandra, Alexandra, you have a tactic Find the here. tactic. Right, you, you don't know that it's there. If you did, I'd be at least 200 points higher. <laughs> if you did, we would both be kicked out of the world of chess forever. Oh, okay, I, yes, of course, because it's cheating. But I mean, if that was legal. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. But um, yeah, I just really feel like it's why I often when I uh, have lessons, I go over games and the homework I give is like, here's a game, tell me what you think about the game. Because if they're doing it correctly, they say, oh, actually in this game, it looked like there was a missed tactic on move 15. But it's not like they were told there was a tactic and they found it. No, they figured out by looking at the position, analyzing that something like that existed. So that's why I feel pretty strongly about um, that's you know, a very, very good recommendation. Um, trying to analyze games without knowing if you're looking for something in particular. 
good coach has times. Yeah. And I, but I do think that afterwards it's nice to verify because like, let's say yeah. someone, it's almost like submitting homework to a teacher. They submit their homework, like, here's my analysis. And I say, okay, this looks very good. I like your strategic reasoning. But then maybe I'm not, I mean, I'm not a perfect chess player. I don't know everything, mm -hmm. obviously. So I say, that tactic that you brought up, let me verify that it works. And then you say, okay, I put in the engine. Eh, it didn't quite work out, even though it looks like it did. And then here's why you thought it worked, but it didn't. Right? You just start analyzing right. the little nuances to help them understand why they missed a certain line and what they can do to see that line the next time. So you got the- So you're using it, the engine more like an answer book, checking after you've already put in the work. It's very nice. It's verification rather than helping me find the ideas in the first place. Fair enough. Um, so let's look at some games. I'm looking at Tesla 37 and Tokras, unless you wanted to talk a bit about the Mamidyarov game since I see you're already there. No, I just had it up to have a game on the screen. So Tesla and Tokras. That's Matthew Cornette with the black pieces playing Sergei yep. Mosesian. I see a knight on d4, but I also still mm -hmm. see a pawn on c2, which means that pawn in the near future is going to kick said knight out of its lovely little spot in the d4 square. Yeah, and so in positions like this, a lot of times you'll see moves like c4 later on because that's the way that you can actually defend the pawn on d5 and the pawn on c4 when you have doubled pawns. How do you make a plan that includes both c3 and c4? Because once you get the pawn on c4, then the knight can just hop back in on d4. Right. And I think we're fortunate to be in a closed position so that the pawn mm -hmm. on d5 is like nearly impossible for black to attack for the time being. And my bishop mm -hmm. on a2 is there protecting it. But it's a great question because some positions you might need to protect it. And then you have to weigh, hey, do I keep the pawn protected by my pawn so that it can never be attacked? or do I make sure that the knight is not getting a square to work with? And here, actually, is a good example of that, is that now I can go bishop e3, so that, you know, I could take on g5, but taking on g5 allows your queen to come out w with an attack on the king. He plays c3, but the point was, by playing bishop e3, you say, hey, come, come take me. I don't mind if you take bishop right. e3. That helps me kick your knight out and opens the f-file for my rook. So uh, I thought that was an opportunity here. Maybe knight f3 will be played now saying, okay, I'm attacking your bishop on g5. If you take me on c1, you help me in the process. And clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about because they're doing <laughs> No, you do. He just went for a completely different plan, but often there's more than one plan that makes sense in the position. Um, yep. Okay, so he, he did not care about moving his minor pieces at all. <laughs> Sorry, I just looked at the chat. Joe Bruin goes, Hess, I can be 2,800 and I still want to watch your streams and listen to your words of wisdom, and then goes later, but my personality is over 3,000. <laughs> right, because somebody asked him if he's rated 2,800. That's great. I love the self-confidence. It's the right way to do it. Um, OK, so it seems like White had a different idea here. He's just going for the pawn breaks on the queen side. Um, his rook is on c1, just preparing for the file to open. He has to wait for black to take on b4 for the file to open, which black may very well consider because if he takes with a c pawn, he'll have two isolated pawns on d5 and d3, also double pawns. Um, and if he takes with the a pawn, then he's not opening up the c file. Right. Then the rook looks silly on c1. If I'm white, I play d4 here. I don't care if I lose a pawn. Oh, but the reason why I want to play d4 so badly was I'm, I feel very cramped as white. My bishop on a2 is not mm -hmm. doing anything. My rook on c1 is staring into my yeah. own pawn. The rook on e1 is staring into e5. And now I feel like for black, here comes an ambulance, by the way. I don't know if it's, it's in the distance. You probably can't hear it mm -hmm. just yet. But um, d4 is certainly a good looking move for black, uh, for white, excuse me, to open the position at long last. And by playing d4, my bishop can snake right back to b1 and then maybe mm -hmm. use that diagonal to work with since it's doing nothing on a2. Right. Um, do you think black is preparing f5 at some point? Tough call, because f5 looks, yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, f5 looks very interesting, and I actually would love to already have my pawn f5 because of this move, right. d4. If my pawn was on f5, then I could play e4 in one move. But with my pawn on f7, now I can't play e4, I just lose a pawn. So I think finally, at long last, Mofsesian has uh, gotten his pieces active, and I think you have to take on d4 once with the c pawn and then play a move like mm -hmm. rook e8 or f6 and just defend the e5 pawn. But right. I think black has mishandled this position from a very good um, start. 
Okay, well, let's come back and see if he has a hold on it later on. There's an interesting position right now between um, Jay Josu and Vincent Masuka. Masuka. They've moved very. They're they've moved very fast. They're already into an end game position. Okay, let me find. There it is. Okay, got whoa. And so the material balance is even here. Black has a rook on d1, so that looks a little bit scary for white. But at the same time, white is super defended here. There's no incoming threats, and if the queen ever tries to help the black rook on d1 then there's other problems for black, like rook f3, queen takes f7. Right. So essentially if uh, Torbjorn Ringdahl Hansen tries to pull a Pubel, we just saw Pubel play queen a8 a1, then yes. he might be under more attack on the f7 square. And this move rook yeah. e1 is trying to go rook to e4 to win this h-pawn. So keep an eye out for right. that threat as well. If I'm white, I'd probably play rook e3 and offer a rook exchange, or maybe... Because mm -hmm. I don't really want to go f3, because I... Oh, knight f3 played, but I thought rook e4 was going to be a problem. So if you trade, if rooks are traded off in this position, who do you think is, well, now black's looking. Yeah, black's. This is looking good for black. Yeah. Oh, nice move, bishop e2. Because yeah. I'm, I'm taking your knight in f3 and removing the guard from your h4 pawn. That's actually really nice. Right. So. Uh, to answer your. Yeah, the h, the h pawn is going to drop. But yeah, to answer the question. No, I think a rook trade generally favors white because you have a knight and your opponent is a bishop. And now, I guess I've said this many times. Oftentimes, you're just like, oh, a knight, a bishop's better. It controls more space on the board, longer diagonals, mm -hmm. yada, yada. But look at this knight on g5. Look at this bishop on e2. The bishop cannot attack that knight. And, for example, if I play rook, we trade. let's imagine these rooks are traded, which they might be in any moment now, and I play queen f4 to h4 and try to go to h7. Like, my knight on f4, excuse me, on g5 is not being kicked out, and your bishop is on the light square and can't possibly attack it. So queen f4 to h4 is clearly the threat now. Yeah. Um, queen f4, queen h4. But is that a real threat? Because even if my queen was magical and teleported to h7 now, yep. the black king can still escape, um, yep. but he would lose g7. Right, and that's, that's the key. Is like, if I get to h4 and h7, and then I win this g-pawn. Uh, first, I restore material equality, but second of all, I also open up more dark squares, the f6 square and things like that, to continue right. the attack. But bishop, bishop, d3, bishop d3 is a cute move. Clever. Very, I actually really like that move. Yeah. So if white took on d3, black would take on g5. Um, I would have taken if I was white, because I don't like bishop f5. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you're right. Knights are better in the end game, so that does make sense as a reason to keep the knights on the board. Yeah, um, queen f4, but I agree with you. Bishop f5 or f6, and well, some order, bishop f5 and f6 now, because that mm -hmm. makes my king feel a lot safer, and you can't take on yeah. e6, and I go queen d7, and I pin your knight, and then bishop f5 right. comes in. So yeah. I guess bishop f5 will have to deal with g4 at some point, which is scary, because then the queen has to stay tied to the f7 square at all time. Yeah, f6, nice okay. move. Okay, so knight takes e6, e takes f6. Which one would you consider, if any? Well, knight takes e6 has, oh. has tactical problems in the diagonal, right? So knight e6, right. I go queen d7 or queen c8, I pin your knight, and then bishop f5 comes next to finally win the knight off the board. So... I like knight f3 because if you take on f6, you're sort of fixing black's pawn structure. So knight f3 mm -hmm. is a better attempt to keep some of these pawns on the board and say, well, if you're going to actually do something with the pawns, then if you take me on e5, you've double g pawns, and I'm going to control the dark squares anyway. So here, right. here queen e3 or something like that makes sense just to uh, keep control of the position. Black is surely better up a pawn. Um, as you know, what, G, f6 and g5 in the last two moves gain space, but white is not totally busted quite yet yep um so i guess with that analysis oh there was a game i went to see yeah it looks very scary i'm looking at the game between uh eduardo iturizaga so i am dimitri against iturizaga yep and, and i am dimitri is always hilarious because he's a gm Right. To so just mislead him. Oh, and he has his old he has his old title. Well, yeah. he is Dimitri. That is true. He is I am GM Dimitri, you know. 
<laughs> Absolutely. But right now he is, I am lost because his position yeah. looks really bad as black is attacking two pieces at the same time. A bishop on f2 and a knight on c3 and the knight can't move to protect the bishop. So... Yeah. I, I guess we caught this game right before it's over. And white's up a pawn, by the way. So, wait, is what? No, white's up a piece. Oh, what's going on here? White's up a piece for two pawns? But unfortunately, um, actually, we can see how this happened. White went f6. b4 was played, and then white went f6, thinking his counterattack would come first. But then knight f6 happened, and rook takes f6 followed. So two pawns were captured for black, and white can capture at most one pawn in return. The, the white king is going to be ripped apart. The black king is perfectly safe, tucked in the corner. F2 hangs, mm -hmm. C3 hangs. Yeah, not loving it. Yeah, this is, is not looking so good. Um, is there any game that you wanted to see that we haven't seen yet? Um, I'm looking at standings, Blizzard, Champions, Hackers. Those are the three matchups. Still competing for first. Let's look at Corrales versus Mamed Yarov because Cor yep. Corrales with the white pieces <laughs> He has gained a ton of space, and I love his position, honestly. Like, he just has much more space to work with. Right. Um, yeah, Mami Jarv is, is normally the one who would have the white side of this position. Yeah. He, he tends to have the more aggressive, active positions. What happened here? Oh, let's actually take a look. So, going back in this game, it was a, an advanced Karakhan where white took on c5 early. So we actually caught the beginning of this game. And, okay. He, so he, he went a5 on move 12. That was Mama Jarov. And Kukarov went b5 and a4 just to gain space on the queen side. Went for a c4 break, which was good. And finally just took over, <coughs> excuse me, took over much of the board. And the space here, he's got a rook on c1, perfectly placed. He just went knight d2, so he can play knight to c4 and then either put this knight on d6 or on b6 or keep the pawn on a5 under threat. So right now Fidel Corrales is playing really, really well, and Mami Jarb doesn't have that much time either to figure out what to do here. Yeah. Um, man, this is just looking really bad. Uh, I, I like asking you what you would do if you had the worst sides of positions, but I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> I would cry. You don't deserve to have to answer that question. I, um, I appreciate you, and I appreciate that, because, I mean, it just looks so painful. The bishop on c Oh, my gosh, Beardstein. I turned his game, and he looks like he's about to mate. Wait a second. Wait, we're, Black actually might mate him. Who is he playing? Oh, Beardstein is playing uh, Kavutsky, who's had a bad start so far, but they both have mating threats. Whoa. This is awesome. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, is it forced? No. Wait. Ugh. Too much. Nice. I was gonna say rook b1 check, and the okay. he didn't take it because I'll show why. If he took it, then bishop a2 check, king a1, bishop b3, king b1, queen a2, and that's a known tactic. So that's a known tactical motif where you put your bishop a check and then put it to attack the bishop's pawn in the position. But Kavutsky puts queen b4 check now. Yeah. King. Is there a mate here? It looks like there should be. And there the reason I'm be. saying that is because there's a queen on b4, rook on b1 blocking the first, the bishop and the rook that can all attack. So when all of your pieces, including a pawn, can help in the attack, you expect there to be a mate even without calculating. Yeah, an f4 check was very important because if white got one more move to get to f4, it's actually, you're, you're not checkmating my king anymore. My king is f4. Right. So f4 check right. takes away that square from the king. And now what? Bishop Ooh. c4 check, king Something c4. c4 check. Yeah, queen c4 check. Oh, bishop makes sense because you want the queen to hold down the c3 and d7 square. Yeah, yeah c3, d2 are held, and then... Yep. So check, I guess you have to go king e4, and then... Oh, queen b7 looks pretty good. Just... Oh, yeah, queen b7, and then white has to play d5, and you take, and it's mate. Yeah, so Kavutsky. Nice. Hey, Sam Copeland. Sam. <laughs> Sam Copeland. Buddy, I can't wait till I Thanks see him. Thanks, um, Wow, so this is the first game that Beardson has lost today. In the others, he had a crushing attack against his opponents. And in this one, too, when I just glanced over the position, I saw his queen on h6, the bishop on g7. I was like, oh, he's crushing again. And then we looked at 
his king, and it was much worse than Black's, and the checkmate came. This is so funny. Oh, Crafty Raf said, GMs always see the difficult mate first. Rook b8 mm -hmm. was also mate. So on that move, Rook b1 check, move 25. If White took on b1, Rook b8 was checkmate in one move. Oh, that's hilarious. So if this was Puzzle Rush, I would have been wrong, and I would have been so mad. Because it's actually kind of true. Like, we don't expect there to be mates in one. When I see a position, I'm looking for, right. like, what's the underlying thing going on? I see, oh, check, 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 mate. Right? Like, bishop a2, king right. of one. I, like, that's my puzzle rush instinct going. Not, hey, maybe there's a checkmate in one. So it's actually very funny and good of you to point that out. Because checkmate in one, obviously, is superior to checkmate in five or whatever happened. Uh, oh, man. That's hilarious. The GM blind spot. Ooh, um, penguin queen, not... Penguin GM has an interesting position uh, because it's an end game Ooh. where so Penguin Queen versus RT Francisco. Yep. So White has a bishop and two pawns for the rook here. So technically equal material, but White is better. Can can White win this? What do you think? So probably not. But important to note that the H8 square is a dark square, and I have a dark square bishop, so you can't just sacrifice your rook for the other two pawns and make a draw against mm -hmm. the H pawn. So here, um, how would I, how would I hold this? Francisco also has 30 seconds. Yeah, it's... So what would your plan be as white to try and trick your opponent here? So sure, let's say it's a theoretical draw, your opponent's low on time, how do you figure out this end game? Well, I definitely wouldn't have gone rook g8 check, but it's probably still fine. I would have played rook to f1 or something to win the e pawn, then try to mm -hmm. win the deep, excuse me, the c pawn with my king. Um, this, wait, now actually white's Gonna win this game. Bishop g7, yep. Play h5. Yeah, because now h5, h6, and there's no way to stop h7. Is the king? No, the king can come, but then the white king can help the other pawns promote, and there's just too much for black to cover here. Yep, king f4. Yep. Well, she won this game really easily. I like how, from a GM's perspective, at first you're like, no, no, this should be a draw. And then we saw the, the 2200 the masters playing and it was not so easy sure time pressure was also involved but study your end games everyone yeah and it's, it really goes to show this rook on f8 had cut the king off and instead francisco moved his rook over to a different file and allowed the king to get back in the game and now okay now it's just several past pawns and your rook is not good at handling all these different past pawns i can go king d3 or king yeah now play c4 if i want and slowly push that pawn up the board this is looking not so fun here. Play, wait, e6 check. If you take me on e6, I push h7, right? I just want to push h7 and get a queen. Yep. So e6 check was a possibility there, but now king. But bringing the king is also okay. She can still play e6 here if she wants to. She also has four minutes, so I would slow down a second and really start thinking about the position because your opponent is 17, se yep, there's e6, good. And you can't take it, as I said, because h7 and h8 becomes a queen. So if you go king g6, then I go e7, I put my bishop on f8, and my bishop is just awesome, defending both of my very, very, very past pawns. So this is just winning. Then now the white king will start moving. Okay. Um, h7. And so while you gave a brilliant explanation of this, I looked a little bit over the other games. Georg Meyer just drew, um, I would say, North Yard. Prince and Vincent Kamer, or Vincent Kamer against Tian Chi Wang, is the most interesting game out there right now. Yep. Let's see. Well, Bishop F8 is checked, not mate, though. I thought it was mate. It's close. Check. It always might be mate, right? Oh, Bishop F4 check, though. That looks pretty good. Bishop F4 is mate. Ooh. It's a force mate. Is there a puzzle rush? Bishop F4, King yep. C5, Queen E7 check. And King C6, Queen D6 is check and mate. Oh, okay. Well... No. Well, this is probably fine too. But there was mate by force. There was. There was. But Okay, this is Oh, good. never mind. Tianchi has a, has 2 minutes on the clock. So he could have taken the time to find that, but he's so winning here. He just won because his opponent resigned. Yep. That is check and mate. Vincent Keimer, I picked you for my fantasy team. Of course you're doing badly because I picked you. That's how this works. Well, the rest of your fantasy team is doing well. Yeah, they're trying. I'll they are. I'll they certainly are. I'll forgive okay. them eventually. Between the last three games... Um, I see four games. Oh, you're right. I had to scroll down a little bit. Um, well, Fidel Corrales, is he beating Mamajaro? Um, 
one. He, he had a much better position earlier. No, he's mm. not winning. And now it's an end game, so we still like the knight over the bishop. But I hate the a4 pawn, so that's why I like the bishop. I mean, yeah. I agree with you that the knight is a nice piece. Well, now I take on c4, <laughs> and I play rook f5. I hate your e5 pawn as well. But you ha you have a lot of hate in this game, Robert. Well, I want um, now. I'm gonna go have you tried counseling? No, Just not talk yet. a therapist, like Robert. You get angry all the time. Oh, these chess positions, though. And then they're gonna show you photos of chess positions, ask you about your feelings. Oh, well, that would be great. You really had to do this to me on air. You know, you if you're staging an <laughs> intervention, you do that like in private. So you're like, hey. Well, I thought I thought peer pressure from uh, viewers would be good. It just hurts, honestly. <laughs> No, I just hate that e5 or that a4 pawn. Oh, I just hate. I just. Oh. I hate it all. I'm really against it. No, I think. Gotta hate them all. Okay. Um, Keep going. But I'll I'll stop. Both pleasure players are in serious time pressure. This should be a draw if they play correctly. Who do you think this is harder to play for? I mean, White has some checks now, so. Well, rook c6. Oh, Rami Jarov de declined to draw. By the way. Yeah, so rook b3 at some point can be played. Try to go. He's just making moves. He's trying to. He's like, I can never lose this game, so I'm going to try to win, uh, just by, you know, kind of outclassing him, outrating him. But check on h7. That makes sense. Keep checking. Check forever. Now you can't stop it. If you go to e8, then rook b7 happens. The rook b7 now. All right. Eventually he'll go rook b7. Right now he'll probably do it. There it is. So you win e5. I win b. What? He didn't take it. Okay, I guess he has time. Wait, isn't white now going to win? I mean, white is going to be up a pawn, and this is technically a winning rook end game. Um, is it? Well, no, because black's king is very close to the pawn, so actually... I mean, now rook b3 is immediately a draw. Yet. Oh, wait, yeah. no, rook a6? Ooh. King c8. You got to get your king in... Uh-oh. Nope, king's on the wrong side. Now it's losing for sure. Yeah, how how did this happen? Mom they're, they're some of the best players out there. Mom or Mami Jarov is, and Fidel Corrales is a strong GM. But playing hard and playing rook end games accurately with 15 seconds is just not easy for anybody, it seems. Yeah, so let's see. Rook e8 played. Now a6 is a threat. Now a6 is not a threat anymore. Mm-hmm. So, oh wait, now it's the draw, I think. This is the where the king needed to be in the first place. So, yeah, I think that he's got the... So, oh, time pressure. The players also don't want to disappoint Hess. Good to see you, Tagvon. A6. Um, he had a... Oh, Tagvon, what's up? He had a6. If he would have played king a6, it would have been checkmate. That would have been funny, but so sad. I think they're both missing things, but they have no time. But I also am not positive that I'm seeing things correctly either. So let's see. Okay. Rook e7. So, okay, rook c5, whatever. I, I like this idea because if white if white grabs e4, he's winning unless rook b5. So no, that doesn't work anymore. And they've already had this position happen a bunch of times. It might already be a draw if someone clicks the draw button. Rook b4, click the draw. Azari chess offered a draw, so no, they hadn't repeated it, but he tried. Can he just play king e5 and bring his king in? Because now he's going to catch the e-pawn with rook e7. Look at you, Wow. Draw. Yeah, that's a problem. Well, Fidel Corrales was moving it as I was, as I was explaining it, so I'll give him some credit for that idea. So rook c4 uh -oh. check. And now rook e Oh, did he blunder? Yeah, no, no, he did blunder. He could have played rook e7. He should have started with rookie seven. That makes so much sense. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, he blundered he back. It. He missed me. Oh, no. He had to go rookie eight himself. And you get a blunder. And you get a blunder. And you get a blunder. <laughs> and, you, and, and you, and you, and you, and you're going to blunder. Sorry. Hess hitting the high note. No, that just, it had to happen. Oh, my God. This was Gets worst game of the week, right? This was so sad. Um, I'm so sorry, Mama Jarov. That sucks. Yeah, so if we just scroll back a little bit here, then here... Mm. So where is his fatal error? Rook h7? Ah, oh, he had to go... Wait, what? Well, on move, so I was looking at move 88 when he played king c6. That just allowed the rook to get on e4. He could have played rook e7. 
Yeah, that would have been much better. Again, the rook Pretty behind the pawn. Straight forward. Maybe he was afraid of rook a4. But then king c6 uh, Which doesn't happens. work because of checkmate. Yeah, so. king c6 coming. No, but even in the game, so rook, king c6, rook c4 check, king b5, rook e4, rook h7. I, if you go rook e8, you lose. Because rook e8, mm -hmm. then white just goes a6, and your pawns are too fast. If you go rook e5 check, the king goes to a6, and then you go rook e8. You stop the white pawn from going to a6, very importantly, and now this rook will have to be tied down to h1 because e2, e1 is a threat. So you go rook h1, put your rook on e1, mm -hmm. but you, your rook is in a passive place, and then I think black can play like rook e5, and you have no more moves. Yeah. So that was a tragic way for both players to play. Should have been a right. draw. Right, and this is Mamijarov's first loss of the day. Yeah. So he has been playing very well today. It, it happens. Um, games like this can be tilting. Uh, do you think Mamajarov is going to play his next game a little bit differently because he's upset, or do you think he has the emotional control? Does Mamajarov have emotional control? I'm, um, yeah, I would hope so because he's lost games before, but that was pretty bad. I mean, that, that just... Would you... You would have complete emotional control after get, getting back rank mated like this, right? No. But I, I don't want to wow. get... We've already had a therapy wow. motion, uh, moment for me. <laughs> but and finally, a game that even Hess would be shook by. Yeah. But, okay, uh, so I mean, let's look at the standings. I'm going to stop. Um... No, no, I mean, I, I'm with you. I'm just trying to figure it out. I saw some comments. I was scrolling up in the chat. So sorry for uh, not reacting. But I was, there was a... Someone asked about... Chess Coach Net typically uses the Analyze Game Engine on chess.com to analyze his games with viewers. The idea is to let players with limited time efficiently focus their analysis on areas where they can definitely improve. Is long-term learning more efficient for non-masters by having them analyze games without the computer's suggestions on where to focus? And that's a great question. It's a really, really yeah. good question, Hipside. And it's not that I am saying that... Hipside always has good questions. Yeah, it's not that I'm saying that analyzing with an engine is like the worst thing in the world. But it's obviously, it, it's efficient, right? It just, it just, boom, spits out what you need to know, or it's, well, sorry, it spits out evaluations so you know at that any moment who is better. But the why and the understanding is the most important part of chess. Kind of get, getting not just your basics, but your fundamental um, comprehension of structures and your analysis to be like, okay, I can calculate knight takes pawn, sacrifice the knight, bam, bam, checkmate. That's in many ways, the easier part of chess. The harder part is when you see a Karpov game and you're like, whoa, why did he just move his piece backwards there? Oh, he's moving his piece backwards so he can reroute that piece and then free up his bishop. And obviously, I'm just speaking in very general terms that don't actually apply to any specific position. But it's much harder to kind of get a grasp over that, which is what you really need as you continue to improve. So. That was a good explanation. On that note, the games are starting. I'm going to run to the bathroom before they get interesting, and I'll be right back. Okay, you're going to leave me, so I'll bring up the... Um, the... I'll, I'll leave you to, to carry the show on me. If you want to copy your camera and have two Robert Hesses, I'm all for it. I'll be right back. <laughs> no, that's too much for everybody to deal with. But we have the individual scoreboards here. Mamajarov, despite that loss, is still leading the pack of board ones with three out of four. Pavel Yanov, Ariantari with two and a half. But as we look at the top of the leaderboard, not just the individual one with the team, well, Miami champions. They've been struggling throughout the year, but they've made some a big splash with Pavel Yanov on board one, Eduardo Tirizaga board two, Tanki Wang board three with three out of four as well. So they're doing very well in those top three boards. And Richard Francisco needs to improve over there on board four because he's a better player than his score indicates. And we see that the Minnesota Blizzard in second, Fidel Corrales doing perfectly well. I mean, very well, considering he just beat Mamajarov. That's a career victory. But Beardson and Bartholomew, the Bs at the end of the lineup, TB and JB are really the reason why the Blizzard are doing so. And Andrew Tang, I know many people uh, love seeing him stream and play bullet chess and hyper bullet chess. But uh, yeah, right now, not his day. I mean, he, this is not really his ideal format. Of course, he's a very talented player. He's a grandmaster. But the, where he truly excels relative to the rest of uh, the world and the rest of players is in the, as the time gets shorter, his chances of winning generally go up. So I just wanted to uh, give a nod to all those teams in the running here. 
Is chess about IQ? Is about knowing strategies? I mean, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's not a question I can really answer. Forktown, what's up? Ravaraj making a C Hess joke. Been there, seen those. Let's see. Thank you, SuperSign99. Justin Tan, I am from Australia, playing board three for the London Lions, three out of four. And I hear my co-commentator on her way back. But by the way, Justin Tan is a grandmaster, so um, not that surprising to see a GM on that board with three out of four. I'm back. I, I hope you miss me a little bit. I actually heard you coming, so I just mentioned that I was very happy to hear you returning to co-commentate. There we go. D Dr. Mad Corral said 95 checks to King B3 against Pavel Yanov. We didn't look at the game, so um, not really sure what we're talking about, but I believe you. And I, that probably, um, you know, something that is worthwhile to look at, but unfortunately, so many games going on, hard to see them all. Yep. So I see you here on the Turizaga and Farley game. Did you already talk about it? Not even a little bit. I've been talking to the chat. I've been going over the individual scoreboard. So you lead us into this game here. What are you feeling with this matchup between two very strong grandmasters? All right. So uh, Terezaka played a Catalan. I haven't played the Catalan myself. Um, so what I notice is that white has more space advantage so far. At the same time, his pawn on c5 can be a hook to open up the position later on yep. by playing something like b6. Yep. So I think it's still pretty early on in the game here. Black also has ideas of e5. Yep. And maybe knight e4 at some point. Although it doesn't make sense right right away. He's trying to open his bishop as fast as possible. Totally with you, you with everything you just said. And that b6 move just played uh, makes perfect sense because you can't protect it with b4, well, you can. You temporarily protect c5, but then black plays mm -hmm. a5. So you just start hammering away at these queenside pawns. And once more, a3. We saw this in a game a while back with on the h file instead of the a file, but a3 doesn't work because a takes before your rook on a1 is not protected. So this has been a theme of the day. Mm -hmm. Just make sure your rooks are protected on the a and h files. Whoa. There's an interesting pawn structure in um, Hello Kostya, Nordyard Prince. So um, Kavutsky versus Tianchi Wang. Whoa. Just because white has four pawns on the fourth rank, black had four pawns on the sixth rank. Can you talk a little bit about how to think about the pawn breaks in this position? Yeah, I just highlighted all those pawns. Actually, let me put those in red instead of blue because those are worse. Well, I like white's position because one, white is the two bishops, and two, that I, my pawns are more advanced. So we both have a line of four pawns, but mm -hmm. white's pawns are further up the board. Okay, e5 challenges the center, but you actually don't really want to take very badly on d4, because after queen d4, then you notice that bishop and queen on the long diagonal. So look what Tanky Wang is doing here. I would immediately play d takes c5, and mm -hmm. there it is, a play for maybe b5, because um, when you do the structure for black, you need to plug a knight on d4. Just plunk one there, bam. And if your knight could, was on c6, then the knight's immediately going to d4. But here, you need to go knight f8, knight e6, knight d4. Takes a couple moves. In the meantime... Yeah, it's a little slow. Okay, no, knight b6, now black is just strategically in um, big trouble. Because now you're definitely not getting right. a knight to d4, and white has <laughs> this open d file to work with. The knight for white can go to e3, well, no, e3 might hang a pawn, so she could go to g3, perhaps, and it just... Yeah, it's not fun to be uh, a black side of this position. Yeah, it definitely isn't. Um, so black is obviously worse. I'm flipping the board to look at it a little bit from his point of view, okay. uh, trying to see if he has any ideas as well. Obviously, he's going to be busy protecting the d6 pawn. Yep. He doesn't want to make a break on the queen side because that's just going to weaken his position. But he can at least try to put pressure on c4 like he's doing now. It's not going to last long, though, because the knight's coming on d5. Yep. <sighs> Although Yeah, finding, finding plans for black is a little tricky here. The knight d5, sometimes you be careful because the queen on c2, bishop on g6, will stare each other down. So there could be a time when knight d5 won't work out, but it does look like mm -hmm. it's going to happen pretty soon. And I like this slow plan. 
h3, mm -hmm. you can figure out when's the right moment to play knight d5, d5, or if my rook goes to d2 and my other rook goes to c1, something like that, I can even put my knight mm -hmm. on f5 just to say, feel free to take it and open up my bishop on f3. Right. Um, Armenia Eagles in the chat saying black is better, h5. I don't believe you. It's okay. Just, just let Artok... He loves the side that maybe can get an attack. So his move, his idea is to play h5 and then go g7 to g5 over the bishop on g6 and then go for an attack. Right. Well, it looks like that's what Black is doing. He played his king to h8, which is giving space for the rook to come on g8 and help an attack like that. I will say that Artok did find a very interesting plan for Black here. And it's very in line with Artok Manukian's usual style of play. So good to point that out. Yeah, some people deal with pressure tactically, others deal with it positionally. Artak going for the <laughs> attack. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's, you know, the most safe idea, but it's definitely one of the most interesting ideas. Oh, for so. sure. But, I mean, the queen just went backwards to e7, the rook just swung over d1. I mean, it's just the clamp is real. You just don't have any space. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think Artok was joking with h5. I think he didn't want to allow any piece on g4. Someone was saying he wasn't serious. If you go h5, then I'm immediately thinking, can my bishop go to c1 and then jump to g5? That's one of the, the different ideas that white can mm -hmm. utilize. Because you have a bishop on b2, which is not great. It's staring into a brick wall for the time being. But if you go h5, then I see a new lease on life for it via g5, potentially. Right. And also, I just quickly jumped to the game between... Gaiwen Jones and Fidel Corrales. So Verde notes and F Corrales. Yep. Uh, I don't think this is theory. It's an interesting position because mm, Black's King is not developed yet. White has five connected pawns while he has two pawns on the queen side, three on the king side, which means that those two pawns on the king side are going to become pretty strong because they're both passed. Yep. Yep, like... But knight takes c6 looks like it could be losing a pawn here. Yeah, but I think that was a good practical decision, Alexandra. And I know you were going to ask me, so I tried to beat you the punch this time. So you could have taken on e5 instead of castling. Yeah. And said, okay, I know queen a4 check is coming. And then I'll go knight c6 back to defend my bishop. But then I see, okay, bishop takes knight, removing the guard. Pawn takes c6, queen takes b4. But we've even material, some might say. Like, that should be what black should do. Because now I'm not down a pawn, I feel better, and I have a light square mm -hmm. bishop, etc. But right. the pawn structure is terrible, you can't castle through check, and so that position would favor white for the single pawn island that you mentioned. You can't castle, mm -hmm. white can go bishop a3 and take over all the dark squares, which seem more pertinent to the position than the light squares. So instead, he castled and said, okay, feel free to take this pawn on c6, but in return, I'm going to get quick counterplay. Because, and that's why white didn't take it. You know, if you do take on c6, which is definitely a reasonable move, black plays rook to b8, saying, you're not castled yet, and once you do castle, now I have bishop h3 with your bishop removed from its home square on g2. So um, you always have to be careful when you start getting greedy because then um, you're leaving holes behind you in the position. So now, with what should happen here, Gawain Jones certainly should be content with the last few moves. Rook a3 here as one example. Even c takes d5 will be a possibility, giving up the rook to get a passed pawn. So I would play rook right. a3 and not look back. Uh, bishop a3 might just win material as well, because it protects the rook with the queen, and then your knight on d5 is hanging. So I yeah, really I like, like bishop a3. Just attacking two pieces seems like the simple way to continue forward. That is also winning. Yep. I'm always for those simple winning moves. Although 97 does come back, uh, but then yeah, you could win the c6 pawn if you want to trade. Yeah, you could do that. You could play queen d6, trading queens off the board and just, you know, mm -hmm. planting that bishop on d6. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those bishops are so strong. And that's it actually raises another good point. That So bishop a3 was played. If you do play knight e7, um, yes, you can win that pawn immediately. But that's the question. Do I actually want that mm -hmm. pawn? Which I do. Of course, I, you know, I want to take a free pawn if possible. But maybe that makes Black's life a little bit easier because there's less pressure on the position. Yes, I'm down a pawn, I'm down some material. But at the same time, my pieces can develop. I can connect my rooks. And, well, look at this knight on c3. Actually, I might just get trapped next move. Yep. I will correct the way I pronounced 
Gowan's name. Gowan. I think I got it right this time. So who told you it was pronounced like that? Well, that's how you said it, and I pronounced it differently than you. And I, oh, I have, was, I'm not some stuff over there. I'm not positive. I I don't know if it's Gawain, Gawain, somebody. Well, it's definitely not Gawain, which is what I had said. Uh, gotcha. All right. Anyway, I, um, I this looks you. like a really nice position. Yeah, e4 here. Oh wait, the rook on a1's hanging, so maybe not e4 here. Wait, what just happened? Instead of rook f e1. White should have played e4 right away just to get rid of the pawn being under pressure on e2. Oh, yeah, hold up. It looks like he just made a really big mistake. Yeah, e4 right away You're was fair. good. Mm -hmm. Ooh. We were trying to pronounce his name instead of trying to help him with to his position. To look at the game. Yeah, we should have helped oh, him. Oh, knight e2. Look at that move. Saying, go ahead, take my knight. Then rook takes e2 comes, and you have to take back on e2 with the queen, but you lose a1 at the end of that. Nice. That's a very nice find. And Fidel Corrales. Wait, bishop c5 though. So maybe it's not so bad for him. Okay, so bishop c5, the knight goes to c2, which would have been, I mean, forking the rooks, but they could have traded, so it doesn't matter. But are there still tactics with the queen? Knight b3, you're right. You just, you said, aren't there tactics? Knight b3. There are tactics. Yeah, this looked like he had to be more careful with the tactics here. Fidel Corrales is a tricky grandmaster. Yeah, this is the second tricky game he is playing where he had a worse... No, actually, he had a better position against Mamadiarov. But this was a nice save on his part. Yeah, he was. I think he was honestly completely lost. His knight on c3 was trapped. His position was terrible. And then he, you know, he just started... Knights are really tricky pieces. And this queen on f6 wreaked havoc over here because it always attacked this rook on a1, the queen on b2 is tied down, and now all of a sudden it's losing, because you take my knight on b3, you lose your rook, and you're being back yeah. checkmated. If you don't take my knight, your queen's under attack, so you need to protect your queen. And now, right. two pieces, yeah. okay, this is just... Now three pieces are under attack here. You can't save them all, unfortunately. No. Um, yeah, you could grab a pawn, maybe, get something out of it, but... Hey, um, you, Sam Copeland, uh, Sam, hmm. so just asking, this definitely should not be game of the week because it wasn't particularly well played. I mean, white was just much better. But if you do a move of the week, knight b3 has to be high up on the list. Like knight takes e2 and then knight b3. <coughs> Thank you, Tagbon, for gifting to the Armenia Eagles and Faith Chess for gifting to Super Sane. Thanks for supporting this chess community, you guys. We appreciate it. Yep. Yep. Oh, look at you. I was trying to get that. Going down a couple octaves? Up. Yeah, you, you got it right. Yeah. I didn't know I could go that deep. Well. Okay. What about Keaton, Kira, and Hannah? Hannah, Bobana, feet five, Bobana, Hannah. Whoa. Okay, so I'm on that game there. Yeah. <laughs> so Hannah is desperately trying to protect that H7 pawn there with her knight. Um, we go from... But there's there's usually tactics in positions like these, or white can just try to double the rooks, rook h4. Rook h4 looks good. I mean, you can take on f3, but it's again what we were talking about before. By trading mm -hmm. on f3, now h7 isn't as uh, under pressure, then the black rook can come to d3, so you don't want to rush with moves like rook bishop takes f3 because that pawn's not even going anywhere. So your mm -hmm. idea with rook h4 makes sense. Bishop c3 to attack the a5 pawn, now that rook moved away makes sense. Bishop d4 mm -hmm. at any moment, although then knight yeah. 96 comes. So you do have to be a little bit uh, careful. Wait, 96 loses the pawn on h7. Okay, so 96 doesn't come. I mean, just completely winning for white then. It's just Yeah, because it's so stuck. Here, I, you can go play f5, e6. Who cares about b3 if you're going to go for checkmate? Yikes. Okay, so this was sad. So let's see. So our Armenian Eagles is telling us to look at Hello Kostya's position against okay. North Yard Prince. Um, what? Wait. What? How? Why? How? What? Isn't Black just winning now? The Beast 5 pawn is totally lost. Uh, well, let's see. It's protected five times. It's attacked five times. It's protected three. 
Uh, yeah, that adds up like a pawn that's going to go down. Yeah, once that pawn... Wait. Okay, I thought black was also already up a pawn, but no, black's not up a pawn, but that pawn's about to be lost. The bishop on c3 is still not doing anything. How did this happen? So I'm, I scrolled back to move 26, and so the pieces just kind of moved around, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Still looks good for white. I, mm -hmm. I guess he just dilly-dallied for too long. And he took on d5 with the c pawn, which made his b pawn a little bit weaker. And Tian right. Tianqi Wang just said, I'm going to put all my pieces on the queen side and come right after your pawn on uh, b5. And in fact, I move 39. He played f3. And then after knight e8, then he played f4, which allowed black time to play f6. This is actually a very good lesson for everybody watching. Um, if you, yeah. Instead of f3, the move f4 immediately was just striking in the center. Right? You're just hitting this. I'm actually very surprised he didn't play it because e4 was also protected, and f3 just blocks his bishop and is super passive here. I almost wonder if it was a mouse slip, but... I mean, maybe just a bad move because f4 threatens f5, which traps the bishop as well. I mean, everything was good about that move. It does look like a mouse slip because he pushed f4 right after. Yeah. Sad life. Wait. Critical tempo. Now he's getting a little bit desperate, probably, because the knight finally found its way to d4, didn't it? Yeah. All right. Um, is there anything else you think white can try to do here or is this time that we switch to another game it's time to switch but where to where um to? what about the game between vincent kamer and jay josu so international master joshua shang and vincent kamer this isn't well the queen if the queens don't get traded it's going to be a little bit more interesting if the queens do get traded it's an instructive end game so it's an instructive endgame that I don't want to give instruction on. Just kidding. Just kidding. Always love giving instructive things. Okay, so black is up a pawn. And so you trade queens and try to win that. But the f6 pawn is actually super annoying to deal with. Because if I take mm -hmm. on d4, let's say we trade the queens here, then all of a sudden I can't take on f6 because knight f6 would be a check, forking the, um, the king and the rook. But very importantly, by taking on f6, I ruin my pawn structure on the king side as well. So, right. Yeah, that's so queen d4 takes over here. Um, and also, the pawn f6 makes black's king just feel a little bit less comfortable. Knight e7 check at some moment could uh, be in the cards. You get rookie one check, trying to get active. Right. Um, but now what? Wait. Check. So there's going to be a rook trade. No, because I'm going to move my rook to b4. There you go. OK, yeah, good call. King h7, rook b4, because the rook trade would be really bad for white here. Yeah, because so this was the way to save it. Makes sense. Well, now white might be better, because I'm taking b7. a7's weak. f7 is right. going to be hanging. Oof. No, but you're right, though. Rook d1, like the knight's on d5, so it looks like you have to trade rooks. Otherwise, you lose your knight. Mm -hmm. But knight e7 check, nice in, in, intermediate move there. And yeah. Oh, I don't like this idea. I don't know why, but seeing that rook blocked and the white rook having all the control on the seventh file is very uncomfortable here. Knight e1 does make sense. Um, maybe f takes g7 was better to do before taking the pawn. Yeah. Because that would have forced the black king to move and not given black the chance to get knight e1. Right. Yeah, so if you took on g7 earlier, the king would have had to take. Mm -hmm. Now maybe even... No, but the rook takes is still knight f5 coming. The th one thing to be very careful about, Alexandra, is if, if I take on g7 and move my rook, say, to, like, wherever, to b2, knight f3 would be a checkmate pattern. Same with here. With the rook on mm -hmm. g7, if I get knight f3, it actually threatens checkmate. Right. So you just have to be careful about things like this. Um, yep. So it just rook, rook takes f7. So yeah, that's a good checkmate to keep in mind. Rook takes f7 looks like a free pawn. He has to be careful after king g6 because it looks like he might lose a piece. But he's going to have to find... Oh, I guess he could just defend his rook with the knight after. Yeah. So king g6, I'll move the knight to d6. And like you said, his, it'll protect his mm -hmm. rook and his rook covers the f3 square, so no checkmates. Yep. So white's up a, a pawn, pass pawn on a, on the A file. Do you think white has good chances to win this? 
nah. Just take on d6, and then put your rook on d2 or on a6 or something, and it looks like it's going to be a draw. Rook takes d6, rook mm -hmm. takes e1, rook a6. you got to protect your pawn with like rook e2 or rook a1, then go rook a3 and just sit on the position for black. Right. Just yeah, and this is, is even being down a pawn, it's a lot easier, especially since there's a white pawn on h3 and a black pawn on h6, meaning that the white king is going to be tied to that h3 pawn, so he can't help come over. I keep clicking on this little opening thing. It's so, it, I mean, it's cool because it takes you to um, like the opening and how to look into the line, but I don't mean to click on it, so it takes me to like another page. I guess. Oh, okay. Uh, but I'm back. Yeah, this looks uh, like it's heading towards drawish territory for sure. Okay, so let's come back to it. Um, what about Justin Tan and Thomas Beardson? Beardson. Whoa. Oh, okay. Pieces were just traded off, and now it's an end game with equal pawns and queens. So who's better and why? I mean, White's king is going to be more, king h4 here or something. Oh, a2's hanging, I guess. But right. And I'm going to bring up something we talked about earlier, where we were saying it's really easy to come to positions like these and say it's going to be a draw. But the right way to think about it is that they're level, right? Yep. It's definitely. I don't know if this one's level or this one's draw, but it's still an interesting position. Yeah, because you have to think, like, is the a2 pawn going to be captured by black? Or by mm -hmm. capturing, does it leave my king too vulnerable? And it looks like right. they're starting to repeat moves here, and they just agreed on a draw. But, yeah, it's very important to realize that the game's not over until it's fully over. And so even though it's queen and a four versus queen and a four, and to some more experienced players, like, well, of course it's going to be a draw. Uh, my queen on f7 protects h5 and protects mm -hmm. a7. There's still some times where you could play a move like king to h4 and just challenge... Uh, say this pawn h5, I might be able to capture it. And can you really get away with queen takes a2? Or like I said, is your king going to get in some trouble here? So I completely agree yeah. with you. The game between Alexei Driev and Georg Myers almost to a close. So I think we need to check it out. 15 seconds for both sides. Um, both sides have an attack, but black is better off if he can fight off the perpetual. Black desperately trying to promote the f pawn here. So I just need to get one check in. If I check you once, I win. So queen d4 played. So queen mm -hmm. takes d3 check is a threat. Now, don't go queen e3 because then there's queen b7 check. So it went b5. And now king e7? Yep. Because rook g7 check, mm -hmm. I go king d6. And somehow you're running out of checks. But I mean, here, yeah. king, king d6. So the king is actually very safe on the d6 right. square. There's just no check left. Um, Black's still trying to find the check. Queen e3, like you said, looking towards h3. So white's out of checks. He lost on time. He was losing on the board. Uh, very good technique by Alexei Drev. Ouchies. Yeah, poor yeah. Georg Meyer there. So who else? Vincent Masuka is playing, I see. Oh, Safar Lee and Iturizaga are in an endgame that will likely peter out. But this game between yeah. Demonte Cornet, that is... Um, she's playing as mm -hmm. uh, Torbjorn Ringdahl Hansen. She's just up a knight and two pawns. So she's easily winning this game at this point. Yeah. Um, up a ton of material. And now it's, it's a forced checkmate, knight b3, king b1, king a3. And it, it would be stalemate, but it was checkmate. Oh, first. I think she's just going to win his rook instead. Yep. Rook a1 or check. Or mate him. Rook a1, a3. Nice. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> nice. She won the rook that way. I thought she was going to rook c1 check and take, but knight d4 check obviously yeah. suffices. It's nice when you have so many options. Yeah. The hey. madame has won. Hey, all the games are over. Yeah, so... So I can pull up the uh, individual scoreboard. Standings, board. yes. How many games have we played? Five? Five rounds in? Uh, I think this was the fourth. No, because I, I just pulled up the individual boards. Iturizaga's four and a half. John Barthon is uh, four okay. and a half. Well, I've been, I've been getting it wrong all along just because you know i want there to be more games because i'm having so much fun and i'm like wow this is my what i've done 12 rounds of commentary thus far i'm totally lost as to what round it is i have no clue like where am i am i, am I yeah yeah okay so it's pulled up now let's see how everybody's doing all right so let's see we have <sighs> flavio perez four and a half 
John Bartholomew, four and a half on board four. Sue Mararora, Mar 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 uh, she is struggling there on board four for the London Lions. We saw her, uh, unfortunately, miss some opportunities earlier today, but she's struggling, but her boards three and two are doing well. At Gawain Jones, that's her husband, they are struggling mm -hmm. together. So that's a nice, nice little camaraderie there. Yeah, not the kind of camaraderie they are shooting for, but camaraderie nonetheless. Yep. And uh, who are you most surprised by? Which team? Which player? John Bartholomew is killing it. Not that he isn't an extremely strong board four, but that's just such a good score. How has he been doing so far in the league before today's action? Like, has he been having a good year, a decent year, a bad year? I thought it was. I thought it was decent year. Okay. Not bad. Not good. But I'm gonna go check his performance. Okay. To see if I am right about that. Yeah, Vincent Keimer okay, let's see. struggling on board three. Button, button across the board. Aren't they? Here, let me pull up this. Oh, thing. yeah. So overall, John Bartholomew has been performing around 23, 29. Oh. So a little bit under his rating. Bad so year. So to see him playing this strong, yeah. So it's actually a bad year, not a decent year. But this is going to help I remember that. one time we just kept seeing him lose games and it was so rough. But look at this comeback. Way to go, John. You know, you are so appreciated by many people in the chess community for your instructive videos. And yep. it's good to see him winning like this. So champions, 12 and a half, Minnesota 12. I'm pulling up the standings real quick just so I can um, see. The Blizzard were in fourth place in the Pacific Division before today. They're doing mm -hmm. very well to try to jump over the Kangaroos. And the Destiny were great earlier, so definitely they're out of reach. But the Hackers mm -hmm. and the Blizzard and the Sluggers, actually, all in a close battle for the fourth and final playoff spot in that division. And kind of based on how San Jose does today, and they can catch up to the Blizzard and maybe even try to get over the Kangaroos as well. And the Sluggers, too, right? Hikaru Nakamura, everyone knows and loves GM Hikaru. That's... Uh, Twitch.tv slash Hikaru, I think is, mm -hmm. is that simple. He's a great streamer. He's an uh, amazing player. He's competing right now, right this second, in the Champions Showdown in St. Louis. So, you know, you can tune into that as well. Um, he is playing as Jan Christoph Duda, who was amazing in both the Pro Chess League this season so far, but also in the Speed Chess Championship beating Alexander Grishuk and Sergei Karyakin. Yeah, and a lot of people in chat have been saying, show Duda, he's not playing today. I would love to have JKD up in here, you know, showing us some good moves, you know, just being the beast that he is. But unfortunately, I'm so, so, can I stress it enough? So sorry. He's busy playing Hikaru Nakamura in the champion showdown. Yeah, and is the championship go showdown going at the same time? I think it is. Yeah. And I know that Gotham Chess is doing commentary on it. So if you guys want to look at that, I'm going to put it as well in the chat. So here you go. Commentary on the game. It looks like they're tied so far. Yep. So that's cool to see. I mean, Duda is great. Nakamura is awesome. So mm -hmm. good matchup indeed. So now speaking of matchups, whew, where do we go? It's just the start of the round, so nothing you know, too major going on. But the champions, Miami, yeah. in first wow. place. Can they hold on? That's the real question. Right. Um, Miami was, is at the bottom of the Atlantic division before this game. So this is going to help them not get relegated. I don't think it's enough to give them a spot in the top four, but at least they can break out of the bottom two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they need to <laughs> not get relegated. That would be a good start for them. But this is, yeah. this is an improved lineup for them. They really are showing a great fight here, and it really comes down to Ituri Zaga, a great player. But it's just much better to have a great player on board two so you can have a super GM on board one, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you know... Alexei Dreyev is amazing at rapid chess, but can you imagine Dreyev on board two instead of board one for the San Diego Surfers? He would just dominate board twos throughout the league. Right. So, um, yeah, I think it's the first, the San Diego Surfers are a good example. They had a gr terrible start to this battle royale, but they've come back nicely to get to eight and a half. They're 
probably going to finish in the bottom half. But if Dreyev could be pushed down to board two, I think their chances would skyrocket because of how strong he is. Yeah, and I'm just looking around between games as you are giving this background. Um, is there any game that's caught your eye so far? Um, not really, no. I guess, this, yeah, this game between Finns is John Bartholomew with a black piece against Sebastian Mihailov mm -hmm. because John is down a piece. I'm going to put down in quotes for three pawns because this is a known line. So if we go back to move um, seven, so mm -hmm. black gains a pawn the opening by playing D takes C4, white can take back on C4, but you play F3 instead on move seven and then play E4. So the only... Um, thing here is that the knight on c3 is pinned to the king on e1, so you sacrifice the piece on e4, and then this is all um, is all theory. So your king ends up on c2. Okay, you win the c4 pawn, and now we're in a position where black has three pawns for the piece. White's king is not feeling very safe. I tend to like these positions from a practical standpoint for black, but I know engines are like totally cool with white in situations like this. Well. I'm sure that if they had enough time to analyze these games, they're probably pretty comfortable with it as well. This is the kind of position that you really want to have spent time on before, especially in a rapid game. And it worries me that Mihailov is thinking here because nothing that uh, Bartholomew has done is out of the norms of the position. Queen f5, your queen is under attack. You put the queen on yeah. f5 for check. Move your king somewhere, right? But if you go to c1, that might be a little bit slow because when I go knight b4, I also throw knight a2 yeah. check. King b3, I believe, is always the move, which is right. ridiculous. And it, it looks wild because the king is coming out a little bit further, but it makes an important decision to protect the b4 square. Okay, Tian K Wang won his game, so I'm going to pop there real fast. Whoa. Yeah, he's just, I don't know what happened there. He... Tian Chi Wang. Tian Chi, that's how you pronounce it? Tian Chi? Tian Chi, yeah. Okay, I'll try to do better. But he played Joshua Shang and... F5 was played, but F5, one of those moves that challenges the center, tries to open up the B7 bishop, but B4 is a nice response saying, well, you open up this diagonal where your king is, and now I'm going to try to deliver a checkmate attack. In fact, he went B4. Uh, Joshua Shank took on B4, and I would have played queen A2 check immediately, just saying, I'm going to go queen A2, I'm going to go knight G5, and I'm going to hit you on the F7 square. But what he did, of course, was also good. And mm -hmm. he got his queen to c4 with check, and his knight to g5. And then he said queen c7, hitting the knight on d6. If you move the knight, you lose the bishop on b7. Shang thought he was protecting the knight, but then queen takes knight. And he resigned because after queen d6, knight f7 check is a fork. And bring out your emos because white goes up a full piece there. Yeah, very nice, nice game that he played. Um, it seems like Tian Shi has been playing very well against people similar strength to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see this with players like John Bartholomew as well, where John tends to do better against people his rating level versus playing GM. So you see him doing better in the Battle Royale where he's playing just the fourth boards versus the regular where you play every other player on the team. Right, for sure. And uh, it's definitely helpful in this battle, like you said, in the Battle Royale format where you're just playing, instead of John having to, um, face off against Mamajarov and against Safar Lee and against whomever mm -hmm. else, or like Shanklin, Negi, and Nerditsky. He gets to play people yeah. just more in his rating category, and he's been yeah. showing off his strength today for sure. Yeah, and he and he's very good at playing those players. Um, also, I quickly went to the Alexei Dreyev and uh, Pavel Elyonov game because Elyonov has been doing super well today and it looks like he has another great position look at black's king oy vey alexandra so i agree with you but then i did a, p a piece count yeah and I, I always i and oh <laughs> the piece count is okay no wow okay there there's uh a knight missing but he has three pawns compensation oh so okay i didn't i didn't count the pawns yeah. i started first i was like okay something looks wrong for black here but then I'm, yeah. then I'm like, oh, wait a second, black has an extra piece. But yeah, you're right, it's actually really not clear here. And in fact, you can play a move like bishop takes e7, and then, mm -hmm. so bishop e7, king e7, maybe try to take on d5. 
but it looks good for black because if you're not checkmating me, you're just going to be much, much worse. The pieces are, especially the bishops, open up really quickly. If e5 falls, then b2 will fall next. That's how I evaluate this position. You know, I, I just start thinking. What about the past pawns, though? But the, they're blockaded. Tell me about the pawns, Hess. <laughs> no pawns. It's uh, the pawns are not going anywhere. They're blockaded pretty well by Black's position. You can take on c4 at the right moment, but then that might allow queen to d6 uh, in a timely fashion. So bishop e3 played, and where do you retreat your queen to? Probably just b7 and keep the knight c6 defended. And then you're going to castle kingside and say, I am up a piece. I don't care about well, your three pawns. That was some good analysis there. I guess I looked at this position. I saw Black's king in the center of the board. Uh, I knew Alinov has been playing really well, so I expected to have more of an attack here. But now that we're looking a little bit deeper at it, yeah, yeah Black, Black can castle out of this. Yep. Um, this is looking... Pretty nice for Black. So, Dreyev, I mean, Elyanov is trying to just crush him. And Dreyev, who is just a renowned Karakhan expert. I mean, expert doesn't even come close to cutting it. And it's funny because expert is actually a chess title that's lower than Grandmaster. But in any other field, you'd be like, oh, this person's an expert of the science of, I don't know, mosquitoes, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> Really? Of everything you could pick? <laughs> there, there's an Amsterdam Mosquitoes team in this league. It felt appropriate. Um, uh, but they're not even playing here. No, I don't buy it. But okay, I, I see what you're saying. I wasn't asking for your money anyway. You don't got to buy <laughs> nothing. So here it just, you know, Dreyev, I don't know if Dreyev tricked him or what, but Elyanov went for a line that is ambitious, but in, mm -hmm. in that ambition, it might backfire. And actually, this reminds me of the, uh, go to the John Bartholomew game, we're being told. So let's check that out because this mm -hmm. game is not super... Um, happy if we're white in this one. So fin Whoa! You know, mosquito science, a mosquitologist. Mosquitologist. What is going on here? Uh, rook somewhere. My rook's under attack. Rook, rook, queen d1 check. I don't know. Rook d5. Okay. Rook, I mean, rook d5 just looks. Where is your queen going? So maybe. Don't get into very tricky opening theory in rapid games if you don't know it well, is the lesson from this game. Yeah, this is actually just totally winning, I think. Because knight c5 check comes in. I'm bringing more pieces. Uh, do I go knight c5 or queen d1 check? Both look really good. But if I go queen d1 check and you go queen c2, then I have knight c5 check, king c3, and then I have queen or knight takes a4 with check. I'm just sort of taking all your pieces off the board one by one, and then I'm going to win your queen. So queen c3, knight c5 check also possible, but then king b4, and I didn't quite see a follow-up yet, so I... Knight c5 After check. king b4? Yeah. Um, can he remove his queen on the a-file to attack a4 here? So queen a2? Yeah, queen a2. Probably queen, queen a1. a1. Probably queen a1 is better because it allows your queen to like run away if you know if the queen trade is offered. Right. So like queen a3 here, you can play queen e1 check and continue the attack. I mean, his king has mm -hmm. got nowhere really good to go. Although queen e1, he can just move his queen back on c3. Wait, why do you repeat the position? E... Wait, well, no. Yeah, why? Don't do it, John. You are much better here. He's not going to take a draw. <laughs>, laughs uncomfortably. If he <laughs>, laughs uncomfortably. Yeah. Like, you could probably just play b What about knight a6? That's also an idea that doesn't draw. <laughs> knight, well, no, his knight's coming from a6. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're right. He just repeated it. So maybe b6 and then play for a5 and just checkmate. Like, that way I protect my b6 and go a5. Um, but why would he take a draw? He's not even down material here. Right, and white can't move. So there's just nothing makes sense in that. He's, would you say John Bartholomew is playing this like a mosquito expert? Well, the, the attack looks biting, so I do like his position. I think he's doing well. There you go. Bam. You made me come up with, that, with little jokes that in the was, spot. You were quick on your feet. Well, I'm sitting down, so I didn't really have to be on my feet. So, you know, I'm here all day. I've literally been here all wow. day. So, yeah. yeah, I know. Hess hasn't moved enough today. Um, okay, I like this. This slow... 
idea preparing a5 maybe if queen a2 was there now then a5 would be almost winning since white would have to sack the knight so slowly taking away all of white's king's squares yep i mean a5 check you're gonna have to sacrifice no matter what because if you go king a3 yeah. then queen a1 will be mate so uh, this is not looking fun for sebastian mihailov really unpleasant and you don't go into openings like this just to reiterate he went into this opening line where he went F3 and allowed a P sack. This is all theory. So I'm not even going to explain it. I'm going to say Google, you know, Slav defense. Uh, what's this called? The check. Alexa, theory. show yeah. Slav theory. Yeah, thankfully I unplugged my Google Home because, you know, I said Google something. Oh. Wait, did your Alexa just go off? Yeah, she did. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like, you know, you Google the Slav theory or you just look it up in database. And you're like, okay, this has happened many, many, many times before. But you can't enter a variation like this without knowing the continuation. And that's why I always say, chess is not about memorization, it's about understanding. You can memorize a series of moves, and then when your opponent plays one move that you weren't expecting, you're just like dead lost because you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't like playing variations like this, because chess for me is much more fun without the memorization, but of course opening theory is, uh, right. is a must. But yeah, just, um... okay, queen e1 check. Keep the checks in, and then play b5 and kick the knight out. It looks pretty good. Yeah, this is looking good. He didn't take the draw. He's continuing on here. Um, there's also some other interesting games. Do you want to check those out and come back after the attack has unfolded or stay here a little longer? If he plays b5, we can go away. If he doesn't play b5, then uh, we might have to stay. But... I mean, B5, just the threat is so clear. Uh, if you, you don't take, you, there's not, first of all, your knight might be just trapped. But if you're knight E5, B4 check, king A2, and then rook D2 or knight C3 check, all win the queen, and your king mm -hmm. is going to get mated anyway. So B5. Yeah, so let's see if he finds that then. Yep. Let's see. So king A3 played. Let's go, John. Let's go. <clears throat> Rooting for a JB. You went rook. rook d1. I mean, okay. That, that rook a1, one, also solid yeah, that's, plan to do here. Yeah. Okay. Um, We're good. I, yeah. I'm, I'm tired are, of seeing. Are we feeling confident here? I was going to suggest looking at Georg Meyer's game. Georg Meyer, where are you, buddy? He there, has a very nice position. Ooh. I feel bad for white here. So I don't know if I should have shown you this because white's pawn structure pawn structure might give you nightmares next time you go to sleep um oh and it was black's and now, move oh my i thought it was and white's now 93. move i was looking okay. for, for like a saving grace because i was like oh it's white's move maybe there'll be something but the position is just so lost now the point is you're winning some material you might not even take the rook of course you can take it but if you take the bishop on g2 then white's king also feels very unsafe so you know queen e1 to defend the h4 pawn now it just takes the material and once the uh, knight is recaptured on f1, black can even just take on e5 and take on d3, and, well, white's position is totally falling apart. That's true. Um, but Pubel's position is not falling apart. Sh she hasn't won a game yet today, and it looks like this might be the one. Yeah, okay, Pubel, where are you? Poo Against soggy cheese. Who are you? Poop bell. Poop. Okay. Well, she is up one pawn. Yep, she's up one pawn. Um, so obviously it's not an easy win here, but this is one of her better positions that we've seen. She's played really tough competition today. She's gained some elo from what we see. Yep. So what is she doing here? So h5, so queen d2. The rook on e8 really bothers me from the point of view that I want my rook to be on like e1 so I don't have to worry about my king safety and then I'll go push my pawns uh, but the rook right. on e8 like it looks potentially menacing because if you can get your queen and your rook on the eighth rank maybe there's some checkmating ideas so now queen d8 is definitely coming to mind but then I see mm -hmm. oh queen a1 check and I have to defend my king again so yeah I'd rather have my rook in a more protective position here so then I could push my a pawn yeah that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
okay, queen queen d8, offering the tr queen trade is amazing for white, so he's not going to take it. She's allowing queen a1 here, so I hope she calculated it. I guess white can always repeat the position back with queen d1, but then the pawn on a3 would be hanging. Yeah. I mean, queen takes f3 just to show everyone doesn't work because it looks like uh, you've pinned this pawn on g2, which you have, but then I can even just take your rook with queen takes g5 and... So mm -hmm. white just goes up in exchange there. So yeah. Uh, King h2, oh, this is a draw with queen e5. Yeah. Black can repeat the position if he wants to here. And the only way to, for her to get out of it is to play her queen back onto d1. Which I would do, by the way. I don't like black's last move. It was, um, it was rushed. Queen e1 check is definitely more precise. By going queen e1 check, you don't give the option of queen d1, so you force the king to h2, and then we just mm -hmm. do a little dance, right? We go queen e1 to e5. Do a little dance. Make, na, 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 na. make a little check. Make a draw right now. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you like queen d1. Yeah, and she played it. She... Do you like queen takes a3, or is that just see... pawn grabbing for no good reason? Probably play queen back to f6 and just say, like, okay, you know, I'm holding down the position. Okay, she's... Oh, he pawn grabbed. He pawn grabbed. He took it. So what would I... I mean, maybe it's just fine. Somehow rook a8 comes to mind to put my queen in front of my rook to try to checkmate you. Um, yeah. Queen b1. So essentially, I'm trying to get my queen on the diagonal. because Queen I feel like... b1? That's a weird-looking move. I'm just trying to get your queen away from me. Like, your queen's really bothering me. So if I go rook a8, I know you're going to go queen to b2. And I don't get a check on the, the diagonal queen d8. There might be some mm -hmm. more queen c1 check to f4. So that's similar draw pattern we saw earlier. So by, right. by playing queen b1, I'm, I'm taking, okay, she won rook a8. So this game probably will still end in a split point after queen d8, queen c1 check. But my, mm -hmm. my major point of queen b1 was just to say, you know, your, your queen's not getting all up in my grill. I'm going queen b1. Your own, All up in my grill, yeah. Your only way out is... This is intimidation chest. <laughs> the only way out is B4, but if you go before a queen A1 check, and that long diagonal is actually very dangerous for black to allow the queen onto. So right. instead she blockaded with she, bishop D1. So rook, queen H8 yeah. is made, so rook H5 looks like the only move. Yep. The bishop and is then, pink. And then it doesn't seem like she can follow that up anymore. She has queen F8 check. So that's obviously something she can consider or moving her king. So she's attacking the rook. Okay, she just went for the check. But you can't keep attacking. You can get a draw, but the king can repeat the position here. Yeah, this is this is looking like it's going to be a draw with queen f8 to d8. So really weird way to make a draw of all the ways we could have seen. This one is, uh, okay, it makes sense. You know, the king is in a vulnerable space square but yeah it just seemed like there were other ways to make a draw but how does this fare for the hackers not a bad draw the lions okay they're in sixth mm -hmm. place so they're trying to catch up they could really yep. use a win by sue uh Maroa, but i don't know rook d8 feels very dangerous i like rook d8 what's my next move as white that's the question yep that is the difficult question here. Um, Honestly, because if White is not careful, H three is coming as well. Yep, counterattack. Yeah, Queen D six. Exactly. But now, I, I like H three a lot here, actually. Okay, so G four, I assume, is the only way to play. I definitely don't want to allow uh, my king to be ripped open. Oh man! So G four, we're gonna allow a pawn on H two. I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that the best option looks a bit scary. So the, the my kind of my point is if I go g4 and you go mm -hmm. rook to g5, I was hoping that I could play queen d8 check and mate you. So king h2 first just to get out of any pins. And then I have threats with pawn to f4 or queen d8 check. It's looking okay. like you know the black king is the one getting ensnared first. So Okay, so that's why you like g4. Um at the same time, the the white king is going to be stuck on h1 in that position. Otherwise, black promotes, so all it would take is a simple check, and white would also be in trouble. Unfortunately, that check is not quite so simple, as there's no way to get on that diagonal, but you're right. Yeah, G4! Let's go! 
She heard you, Hess. I'm proud of her. She's trying to make you proud. If she's been anything today, it's incredibly brave. I've loved the way that she just like fearlessly approaches the position and goes for the attack. By the way, um, her husband, Gawain Jones, has just 27 seconds to Shakira Mamajarov's 15 seconds. Although wow. Mamajarov is currently up two pawns. Two pawns? Two pawns. And look at that. <laughs> There's a peace sacrifice. What is that? Okay. Whoa! It takes... Why are they all sacking? Yeah, that's actually really interesting. So, oh, take on b3, another knight on g4. But you can't take it's on g4, you lose the rook on a4. Yep. That's crazy tactical vision by Mama Jar. It is. It is. Okay, so it makes sense. Just move your rook here. He's finding these so quickly. Yeah, let's go back to uh, Pubel, though. That game is more interesting. So the king is on e5. Okay. So. What just happened? Is the king going to e4? Can it go that far? Can it go to d4? No, it went back. e4? Where does it go from e4, though? Whoa. So, so f6? Well, yeah, f6 makes sense. Let's not forget white's bishop is still unprotected Wait, but because it, the queen moved. If you move your king, white would have rook a1 to defend. That would have been really nice. Holy, what is... The king is on d4, but you can't take my bishop on d1. So king h2, you couldn't take the bishop because I would have queen d8 check in between. Right, right. Whoa, what? No! Oh. Ah! Queen blunder! No! No, it hurts so bad. She was playing such interesting chess. Oh. Got another one in the poubelle. It pains me so much. That's so sad. That's so sad. Okay, let's, let's leave. As quickly as we can. Wait, so after bishop d5, the f6 pawn was hanging with... Ch oh. Just forgot the rook protected the bishop. That hurts. Let's yeah, go somewhere queen else. Six f6 would have continued her... Oh. And uh, Safar Lee drew with Movsession. And I have the Gawain Jones game where Gawain is simply just losing because the b pawn is, is about to promote. So he sacked his rook for the bishop on f8 here because that's a... And there's resignation. Takes, 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 b6. Note, your king is not in the square. What is the square, you may ask? These, oops, the, this is the square. Three by three square. Because my my pawn is in the sixth rank, you need to be in this square. And it's just, I did a lot of drawing like this in the Tata Steel event, yeah. but it's very important to know your squares to cover pawns, right? So you need to be able yeah. to be in the square to cover the b8 prom promoting square. So, um, so when once we're done with that, we can look at... Well, actually, the last two games are both interesting. Uh, Penguin has two rooks versus a queen, and uh, Diamant Cornet has a queen versus a rook, a knight, two pawns. Okay, I'm going to go to the queen. Pick your poison. Yeah, I'm going to that queen situation. So that pawn is one square from promoting that black pawn. Um, yeah. But the white pawn, I mean, it's really confusing seeing the board like this because black is promoting this way, white is promoting that way, and... Yeah. Oh, the rook! Did, are we just seeing all the blunders? Oh, wait, who's white here? Oh, Cornette is white. Yeah. So she's going to win because Vincent Keimer just blundered his rook. Um, Alexandra? Sorry, my mic... Oh yeah, now you're, now you're back. I, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, Sorry good, good, I can. Did you just go to Verizon or Sprint? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, this... Neither. Oh yeah, what, what's your... I, I, was, I was leaning back enjoying the show. It was on me. <laughs> Thank okay, let's, let's hop over to... Oh, Andrew lost one of his... Sorry, Andrew won his opponent's rook. What is... is everybody blundering? Stop it. Yeah. Yeah, there was another rook blunder in this game. It was, oh, God, that's awful. He simply hung his rook. Oh, no. He tried to go for a win or something with rook f5, and then... Wait, but sometimes these kind of positions are a fortress. I'm not, like... You're not sure that it's winning? It's a draw. I think it's a draw. Because your king never has access in the game, and you only have an h-pawn? Or is this a draw? Queen e2, check it. You have to go king g1. So it's important not to go king h3. I think, mm -hmm. because 
Sometimes the king h3, the queen will go from f2 to g1, and your king will right. get in trouble. King on f3 as well, I'm not positive is the best way to be, but um, the point is you're swinging your rook from h4 to f4, and mm -hmm. that means the, the black king can't approach. The king can go all the way over to the queen side, but that's, there's nothing happening on a5. So here, right. king g1. Now, rook h2. Oh, if you have king g4, rook h4 check back. So, so here, Got it. all right, I'll try to put on the board really quickly. King g4 check, king takes g3, rook h3 check, stalemate motif. You take my rook, it is stalemate. My king can't move. So instead, oh, trying to revert to the game. Here we are. Yeah, this is a really nice draw here. Yeah, these, um, these fortresses are really annoying, but it's hilarious that you blunder a full rook and you still And you can draw. still draw. Yeah, Tang, yeah. Tang's going to be a mad, but he's got nothing really to be upset about. He should never have won this game in the first place. Right, right. Um, do you think he missed any winning chances earlier when there were two pawns? Yeah. I, did he have two pawns and a queen against one rook? Because that would have been more tricky. Yeah, maybe. But his problem is his king couldn't approach. That was the real issue. Oh, nice. Yeah, so white doesn't want to take the queen. Is his king going to be pushed out? I think so. Yeah, this is very Why smart. Why risk it, right? Yes, yeah, that's a very good attempt by Tang, by the way, to win this game. If you take the queen there, then once his h-pawn goes to g4, I'm going to start boxing your king out. So this is actually pretty nice. Greg is betting that black is going to win. Let's see if he is. No. The man with the answers. No way. <laughs> Well, you, you say that to most of what Greg says. Uh, obviously, it's a draw based on theoretical position, but we've seen so many blunders today that I wouldn't be that shocked. Are you trying to call this the seventh blunder of the Pro Chess League? Uh, No, not anymore. <laughs> Wait, where did that pawn go? He just went to H4. He's like, okay, I give up. Yeah. He's like, ah, you take my pawn. Yeah, you're... I'll feel better about a draw if it's like this. That's true, right? It's like, I don't have that pawn... So yeah, I can. You've you've created a nice fortress. The G three H four F four configuration, nice. Yeah. Okay. So Greg yeah, is wrong. Greg, no one ever defends any position in bullet. Well, that's often the case. So he did have some point there. Greg is wrong, which I'm not too unhappy about. Um, do 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 do. Yeah, this is going to be... I mean, they're still playing. Right. This is ridiculous here. But it's Blizzard versus Gnomes. Blizzards will t be tied with the champion. Also, they're not Blizzards. They're Blizzards. I should correct myself. The Blizzard True. are tied with the champions up in that draw. They jump to 14 and a half. So the last round is approaching. Let me pull up the standings, mm -hmm. the general league standings before this uh, match just to show everyone where we were coming into today. We see that uh, the gentlemen, the snowballs, the windmills, the pandas. But Dallas Destiny was a force today. They won their battle royale. So after this week, I believe we'll see the, the Destiny jump over the pandas. The marshals have been great. They're right behind the windmills before the week. I'm not sure how they end the week, but we'll see that. And um, look at the Eastern Division. They have the highest scoring teams in the league. Wow. The gentlemen have just been so strong this league. It's incredible. Same league as Armenia Eagles, last year's champions. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? They, they would be, yeah. Armenia would be first by quite a margin in any other division. But Tbilisi right. has been unbelievable, except for today. They were not that great today. It's very, very strong teams this year. Um, who do you think is going to win the Eastern Division? Not me. Just curious. Oh, um... Or who do you think has a, a better chance? The Gentlemen or the Armenia Eagles? This is not too tough a decision, considering... Actually, it is. The lead is not that much, and the Ar Eagles are very strong. I don't know. I mean, they play each other, I think, next week, so... Right. So I guess that will help determine. Okay, no more hard questions. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, I'm just taking a little bit of a break from all the difficult questions you... Right. It's way. only your, what, eighth hour of commentary? I don't know. I'm, I've lost track. What time did I start? Like, Oh, okay. Maybe more like your six. No, we're going to the seventh. That's for sure. Yeah. Hess has been doing double duty today. So let's appreciate Hess in the chat. If you guys haven't already, hover over his face. And then three buttons will pop up so you can follow the chess channels. 
Hess is going to start streaming more often now. Yeah, if I if if I don't do double uh, commentary sessions for sure. I was actually going to stream today after this round of Pro Chess because I would have did the first shift, I would have been off for this shift and then I would have some, done some streaming, but I mean I just I'm already on my 7th hour of commentary plus I had to set up, you know, the show earlier today and all that. So I've had a long day. I mean, you'll have to excuse me. You have. Life is tough for everybody, but um, yeah. Will you actually be streaming? Hey, Liquid Egg Product doesn't believe me. I wow. was. Wow, guys, give him some credit. Come on. Wait, watch this. Chess Bay, if you're in the chat here. Chess Bay, back me up. All right, final rounds. Let's go to the, the big board here. And let's okay. get, whew, Miami champions are in first with the Blizzard. So Blizzard playing the Snowballs. We have Fidel Corrales with the Black Pieces against Georg Meyer. So let's just try to focus on those games for the most part. I guess the Hackers have an outside shot at catching up, but we want to see who wins not only the all the points, but also a $500 bonus for winning the Battle Royale. Yep. Um... So are there any matches you're excited for in this last game here? Well, I have to be. We have Elyana versus um, Gawain Jones. So that's the Lions taking on the champions. And we just saw the Blizzard are taking on the Baden-Baden Snowballs. And Baden-Baden, before this week, were just in first place, amazing in their division. But the Snowballs are in last place here in the Battle Royale week. So not a good showing for them. Vincent Keimer, my pick in fantasy, is rebelling against me and just trying not to make... She's trying not to allow me to win the fantasy prize. Well, you can't win everything. You've already won the chat's hearts. Oh, so well, that's I, more important. Woo! I, I win the emotes of me all over the place. So last yes, round. Exactly. Last round. They're not going to hold anything back. Uh -uh. Alexandra the Great. Where are we going? So let's look at some Minnesota Blizzard Miami Champions games. They are the ones playing for first place here. They deserve to be given a little bit extra attention. Um, the game. Let's look at John Bartholomew's game. He's been playing really well. Yeah, Finns. He, uh, He's beloved streamer. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely so. Um, all right, so I just came to his game. What do you think about his queen being on F5? A lot of times coaches tell their students, don't take your queen out too early. What are your thoughts? Well, the queen on F5, the lady has gotten really advanced there, but it's not actually threatening anything. The knight in D7 was going to stay there regardless to protect F6, right? So it's not like you're adding an extra threat on that square. White, right. generally speaking, plays A4, B4, B5, the pawn minority attack against a Carlsbad structure. But... This rook on c1 usually is on b1. The other rook on f1 is usually on c1. So it looks like things have not gone the right way for John Bartholomew. And something very important to point out, when you play the move a3, Alexandra, what square mm -hmm. do you leave vulnerable? The b3 square. So maybe I'll park my right. queen on b3 at some point and just try to claim the light squares over there on the queen side. So it seems like Hannah's queen is doing a better job here than John's. Uh, ooh, well, now a5, this is... This is a big problem for, for white. In fact, I think white's already in big yeah. trouble. Yeah. Um, and the reason that white is in big trouble here is because once it gets opened up, it's going to be better for black. Oh, oh queen. Now the knight got onto c5. No, queen b5 was not the right move. Yeah, that was not ideal. Um, sh do we want to go back and, and see what would have been better instead of queen yeah. b5? Yeah, I thought you should have just put her queen on c7. And I right. know you don't want to put your queen on the same line as the rook, but b5 is not possible. I know it's a pin, but a3 mm -hmm. hangs with tempo. So that's really the important part there. And you, know, you're, you protect your knight on d7 as well. So when knight c5 happens, you're not worried, oh, wait, I might lose a knight here. In the game continuation, after queen b5, knight c5, now your knight is actually under attack by two pieces. The queen on f5 has come in handy. And this trade mm -hmm. is not one that black wants to make because now the b file right. is open, and here comes rook b1. Yeah, and look at that b7 pawn. That is going to be a problem, the backwards pawn. Um, yeah, that's not good. 
not good news at all. Play Rook B1, play Rook B wherever, play other Rook mm -hmm. to B1, and just squeeze. You're going to, yeah. yeah, this is not good. Not good at all. So this game looks like JB is doing work for the Blizzard. And this is a great matchup, by the way. Blizzard versus Snowballs, right? Yeah, yeah. How many Snowballs does it take to make a Blizzard? Way too many. So uh, chat seems like John. Yeah, chat, you guys can answer as well. Yep. And you get a Tootsie Pop if you get the answer right. I don't know who's giving Aww. you the Tootsie Pop, but. But yeah, just find one somewhere. Give, give yourself your own prize. Um, Right, I'm browsing through the games. 42, apparently. We're having some interesting guesses at the very least. I just went over to Georg Meyer and Fidel Corrales' game. Since we are sticking with the Minnesota Blizzards for a little bit, uh, the small snowball trying to take down a big blizzard. Okay, so you said Georg Meyer? Mm -hmm. Don't mind if I do. Georg Meyer here with the white pieces. Going right after those, wait, bishop d3 hits two rooks at the same time. Yeah, it does. I, um, I like it though, exchange sacrifice. Just give me that pawn on c5. Take right. my rook, I dare you. Do it. Bishop f1, <laughs> I'll take back with mm, some piece that I can't figure out yet. Maybe my queen, maybe my bishop, I don't know. It all looks okay. But the point is that the light squares will be very vulnerable for black. So you're like, okay, giving up the bishop, excuse me, the rook for a bishop and pawn because the d5 pawn is isolated now. This bishop from f1 can go to a6 or to b5, taking over some of the exposed light squares in the position. But if I'm, I think Corrales is thinking, well, do I play c4 here so I don't give up that c pawn, or do I go for the material? And that's actually a very interesting moment to dwell on. Alexandra, do you go for the material, or do you go for the positional clamp with pawn to c4? I think I would go for the material, just being honest here. You know I grab pawns. I also like to grab material. Um, and I'm looking at the position after bishop takes f1. Yep. I think that black would be able to defend it enough in the sense that white's pieces are a little bit more active here and bring the rooks to the open b file. I just think he's going to get a better game that way. That makes sense to me. What would you do? What would you do? Oh, they just called you a material girl. Living in a material world <laughs> when it's right for the position. I like it. I like your new rendition yeah, of that song you. about this position. <laughs> uh, Botez remix in the house. Okay. I love it. Um, Joe Bruin says, if a GM offers a fork like this, I might be suspicious and go for the clamp. Now, I sort of like what you're saying, but I don't mm -hmm. love it because... You should play the board. I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. Finish my sentence. Play the board, not the player. There you go. You know what I'm talking about. And the point is that when you start playing the opponent's rating, you adjust your strategy, which, okay, that could be a good thing if you're deciding between equivalent moves. But you should not do it just be like, okay, I'm scared my opponent didn't miss something. You don't give them too much respect. Humans miss things all the time. So, you know, you can't just be like, there's no way my opponent missed that. Oh, I'm going to think about something else. That's how you right. miss good opportunities, so. Right. Um, so yeah, Fidel Corrales did go for it. Um, again, White's, White has a fine position. We'll see if the material advantage will be enough for him. I think it will be if he can get a little bit more by using the fact that he has more pieces. Otherwise, yep. the D5 pawn is gonna be a little bit annoying to take care of. Yep, we should go to this uh, Tianqi Wang game, I believe, because I see a rook on e6, a queen on b3, uh, Justin Tan with the white pieces here. Some kind of checkmate feels like it's in the air here because rook e8 check, queen g8 check, things like that. But the bishop on g7, excuse me, on f6, allows that mm -hmm. king to run to g7 over to h6, perhaps. And by the way, right. Ituri Zaga drew his game just to head over there really fast to show the final position. The reason okay. the game ended in a draw was the king went from g1 to g2 the queen went from e1 to e4 if you ever play f3 to block the check that's met with queen to e2 check and then i can always give you a million checks anyway so um instead iturizaga called it a day saying good game sergey you defended well you parried my threats okay draw by repetition feels like an appropriate finish i'm sure they were just as polite as you were with that explanation i mean you know sometimes i have to be polite because normally i'm just 
you know, I'm rude. Speaking your mind. Yeah. New York style. All right. Um, so the Tian Shi Justin Tan game has evolved a little bit. Okay. White went for the rook check, the queen check, and now Black's king is on h6. How does White finish him off here? You, you, you don't, maybe, but you try. But if you try yeah. your best, but you don't succeed, and if you get what you want, but not what you need. You'll try to fix you? Yeah, there we go. So you try to okay. you try to fix it with queen f6. Look at you. Yay. Of course you know Coldplay, the Canadian band that they are. Um, I mean, Canadian superstars, hard to miss them. You queen, f, uh, queen, queen f6 here, right? You're trying to fix, your yeah. king's on h6. So you want to fix that. And by playing queen f6, you say, let's go down into an endgame opposite colored bishops. I don't care even if you go up two pawns. That gives me more chances to survive. And if you mm -hmm. go queen e3 check, let's say, I have queen g5, and I continue trying to get into this endgame where if you don't mate me, maybe that black queen can go down to c1 or something like that and reverse the fortunes of the position. So I would definitely go for queen f6 here as I think it's the best way to try to trade off the queens in a way that I don't see how white can really take advantage of. Right. And if I were white here, I'd try to at least grab one more pawn before I trade off queens so that it will be easier for me to force a win. Yeah, someone goes, Coldplay are definitely a British band. Just let it happen. Just like, oh, well, I was trying to, I mean, you know, I was trying to, ugh. people. Canadians still consider the Queen of England their queen symbolically so Coldplay is symbolically our band okay okay i just wanted that to happen you know i just wanted you to embrace it so instead of like questioning fix you you're like you had a hesitation there i just wanted you to be yeah. proud and say it out loud and if i i thought if i said they're canadian you'd be like okay yeah i'm feeling that yeah okay we'll, we'll take it Squ um, yeah squatchy, a bit of a reach squatchy apologizing there we are oh it's let's okay. check out safarley's game he just pushed f6 where is safarley black is gonna probably push g6 but then maybe the queen is gonna eventually get to h6 no because there's a bishop okay yeah this is gonna be interesting <laughs> neither player in the in so they're in the hackers the hackers okay they still have an outside shot g6 played closing down the king side saying okay your pawn f6 looks mm -hmm. nice but if you threw it off the board then you don't have attack on the f7 pawn and knight h6 check my king can always run to f8 i would just play bishop to f8 at some moment here maybe now mm -hmm. just to defend my king side i think safarly is actually in trouble here he's also down a pawn but um should we go to the games in the match between the champions and the blizzard just to focus on them i see Finns. yeah john bartholomew won his game and he that was a quick win he won because after knight e5, um, Henry Marie Cluck threw in the towel saying, if I take with the knight on e5, I lose my rook on b6. If I take on b2, trying to get out of this, queen takes f7 check happens. And then once the king moves to say h8 or h7, then rook takes b2 happens. My knight's hanging, my rook's hanging, my king is unsafe. So nice finish there for JB. And he, John, if you're listening, you're probably not. Work on that opening a little bit. Just it, it didn't go your way. But uh, it ended up, that, this is a problem with games like this, honestly. You feel like it, you did everything right because it just was so easy for him to get the advantage. Um, but, you know, you do need to check games like this and try to make those little improvements so you don't get in trouble in the future. Yep, that's a good point. And so let's go back to seeing some of the Blizzard Miami games. Um, let's see. So What about Andrew Tang? What about Andrew Tang? Penguin GM. Okay, let's check. Um, he looks like he's in a bit of trouble here. He's the one who is facing an attack. Um, and the material is equal, so he doesn't have compensation for it. He also has his rook on the seventh rank, but he only has one piece, so he doesn't have. Uh, I agree with everything, though. I mean, it just looks... If I take f2, then I may really get an attack. So if you move your knight away, say you go knight to, I don't know, e5, I'm going to go knight takes mm -hmm. f2, follow that up with knight h3 check, and then put my bishop on e4 and try to mate you. Yeah, and I just looked at chat for a second. Biden and Biden snowballs have not done well in this battle royale so far. Um... Yeah, so it's the top seed playing the last seed. That's kind of fun. Yeah. At least, you know. 
upset special in the making, or maybe not. But here it looks great for Dimitri Collars. He's got an extra pawn. He can take on b2. That, that will be the extra pawn. He can go bishop to e4, plant that bishop there. Don't go bishop e4 now. That actually blunders to f3, and you get back rank checkmated. So you have to be oh, very careful. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. Good find. Yeah. So bishop e4, not quite working out. Maybe just play a move like h6 and say, okay, I have the king, king h7 for the rest of the game. I don't have to worry. There's h6. Nice move. Mm -hmm. And once I get my bishop to e4, I'll be a very, very, very happy camper for yep. Dimitri Collars. So I see who else is in this match. You know, Pooh Bell versus Richard Francisco. That's the champions versus the London Lions, but a relevant mm -hmm. match for sure. Mar Mararoa, she, her king looks like it's vulnerable to attack. I, if white could play rook c3 takes a3, it would be checkmate. He's trying to climb the ladder. Rook b4, rook a4, rook a8. So he went rook mm -hmm. b3, rook to b4, rook to a4. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, did she... Okay, I guess rook before you have rook c8 just in time. So rook c8 here kicks that bishop out from c6. I don't care about my pawn on f5, so after rook c8, you can go ahead and try to take this pawn on f5. I don't care. Most mm -hmm. importantly, I've saved my king. Yeah, that is definitely the most important thing Oh, no, here. oh, no, she walked into mate. Rook a4. Ah, uh, yeah, and then he has to, she has to sack her rook for the bishop. Where was that bishop just there on f6? So she might have... Had to play bishop f1. What a saving move there. By playing bishop f1 instead of bishop g5, you say if your rook takes f1, I win your c6 bishop. Otherwise, I can take your knight on b5 if I want from f1. So that was definitely a missed opportunity here because now she was forced to sacrifice the exchange, but she's still fighting Alexandra because bishop f4 takes h2. Honestly, I could see... Okay, knight d6 threatens rook c8 mate. So knight d6 is a very good move. But if not for knight d6, if you don't see that move... Bishop f4 is just a really menacing threat. Right. Um, and when, once we're done with this, we have to check out the Mamajaro game. It's just okay. crazy right now. Well, I feel pretty done with this now that knight d6 is played. Rook c8's made, so you go rook g8 and you lose b6 as well. It's just terrible. So, Mamajaro, where are you? Shock we are. I'm looking for you. It, it's it's a lot to digest. Um, where are you, Azari Chess? Oh, there you are. You're playing Orientari. So, whoa. What? Um, pins everywhere. Discoveries yeah. everywhere. Black is... Typical Mamijaro position, right? Is Black up a pawn or something? Um, well... One, two, four. One, two, three. Yeah. Mm, so, yeah. technically yeah. up a pawn, but your bishop on b7's hanging. The pawn a6 is weak. The pawn e6 is weak. The knight on c7 is not really pinned, but having a hard time moving. My head hurts. It should. This is... This is a very complicated position. How do you even start to understand positions like this if you haven't been playing them and you're just switching here? I ask you what to do. That's a great way to start. All right. So let's let's see. Who would I prefer to be here? Um, I like white's pieces better yep. since obviously black is very defensive here. Mamajarov has an extra pawn on a6. I think I should be able to win it back at some point, I mean, I could even just queen takes a6 right now if I want to. True. And then if the queens get traded, I like white's position slightly better because I have the better pawn structure. e6 is an isolated pawn. Mamajara have is the bishop pair, so it's actually pretty equal. Yeah, no, actually, that... Yeah, so th there was my analysis of this position. Well, actually, that's what just happened. Queen a6 was the trade yeah. that happened here, and I agree. I mean, the pawn e6 is a bit weak. What... Black is the two bishops. Like if that bishop was on b6 rather than f8, I really like Black's position because the bishop on b6 would hitting, be hitting f2. But of course, how do you get your bishop there? It would require you to go bishop e7, bishop d8, bishop b6, or as what he just did, rook a8, kick the knight away and try to get bishop c5. But look at that. Right. Just knight c5, and the other knight can go to e5 or g5. I think the game will peter out towards equality. So Yeah, it, it was a very complicated position, but then everything got traded off, so... Yeah, you're right. It will peter off. Um, so let's. So are there more Miami or more Blizzard games left? I feel like we, we have some here. I see Georg Meyer still going against Fidel Corrales. That uh, Tian Chi Wang from uh, Miami Champions, who's been playing super well so far, he has an interesting position, because we looked at it earlier. The king is still on h6. Yeah. And it looks like, 
White is holding off the attack still, still up a pawn, but not. So, it's, it's gotten worse for Black. So, well, the F2 pawn now is a threat, so I can play Rook E2. I don't want to trade Rooks. Can I go H4 first? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. H4, so it, just tactically, if Rook F2 fails, I take your Rook, and mm -hmm. once you take my Queen, I take your Queen with check. So right. you know, that would be a problem. And if you go after queen, Rook F2, Queen F2, click Queen D5 check, I think your King gets mated because I have Queen F3, Queen takes E6, and Queen to F8 with check. But something like this looks very scary for, I don't know, maybe it's somehow still okay here. I also oh, like, what about Queen F8 as well? Instead of... Oh, oh never mind, you were, you were looking at that, okay. No, no, you, I, sorry, I just was in my own head. He traded Rooks, which I don't like, because I think now Black is going to survive. And the problem for Black, excuse me, for White to win this game is you'd like having your Rook on the seventh rank and then trying to get a check with the Queen. With the king mm -hmm. on g7, you could put a queen on f7, and then on the diagonal, but my, I have a dark square bishop, and my king's on a dark square. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it looks like it's... Um, Tianqi yeah. Wang is surviving this one. Definitely. Uh, we haven't checked on our homeboy Beardson in a while. Beardson! All right, whoa. Yeah, Minnesota Blizzard. He's been playing really well here. Uh, so. Material is equal but queen h2 check scares me so much because yeah. you force the king back in you know, rook g6 i mean that also looks good rook g2 yeah. is material is equal but black's position looks way better mate incoming oh mate for sure rook g2 check king d3 queen d1 uh, and then so, king c3 so here here queen d1 king c3 queen mm -hmm. a no rook c so got a queen a1 check Thing. So if you go to b4, right. I mate you on a5. If you go to yeah, so d3, his king can never go to b4. That's an important point to note if the queen is on a1. Yeah, this is looking unfriendly. Hold up, does he move? No, king e2. Still thinking, Beerson. But this is great time management by him. He's 50 seconds. This is when you use mm -hmm. your clock to say, do I go rook to g1 and threaten rook e1 check to win your queen? Do I play rook right. to g2 check right away? Maybe I throw on queen h2 check. You have all these different checks that look very good here, but... Mm -hmm. And he went rook g1 after all that. And 10 seconds for white. Now play okay. what move? I, does rook f1? I liked rook c1 for a second because preparing queen d1, but he just blocks, so that doesn't work. It's actually hard to find moves here for okay. black that are winning. He went queen a1 check. You know that rook g1 wasn't right if your next one was rook g2 without a check. Yeah, yeah. But it looks like he fish, fixed oh, the position. It's force mate, actually, now that I think about it. You go queen d1 check, king c3, rook c2 check. Mm -hmm. he might, I hope he does this. Rook c2. And then king okay. b4, queen a1. There it is. He's going to see it. Very nice. There it is. Queen a5 is mate, and I don't think it's stoppable. You have to sacrifice yeah, he, all your So pieces. he missed this the first time, but then he corrected his position by putting the rook back on g2. Yeah, but I forgive him because I also missed it. So it's like, uh, yeah. you know, eh. it's okay. Time pressure. Wait, Georg Meyer's five seconds left. So we're going to... What happened in this game? Meyer was in trouble, and now he's up two pieces and two pawns against a rook. So it looks like the snowballs are about to ruin the Blizzard's chances here as... Wait, wait, wait. How did this happen? Oh, it's going to be bishop. It might be bishop and knight checkmate, by the way. That would be nice to see. Uh, Crypto Chess has been super excited about Miami the entire time. It's nice to see somebody who's a big fan of, of a team finally getting to celebrate that victory. It's a yep. lot of fun. Um, so, who Very are... nice play, blocking off the rook from defending the pawn. Okay, G8 Queen, can we go away, please? Yeah, let's go to the um, Tan Chi Wang game against Justin Tan. And yeah. it looks like there's a half point of separation between the Blizzard and the champions, but... Oh, so close. But now uh, Corrales is going to lose his game. And Tian Chi uh, Wang is going to draw his game, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So Queen H5 check. He's just going to keep the wheel going. Queen D1, Queen E2, Queen H5. Just check. It, it. This is, a, a draw is a great result for him in this game. And After what we saw earlier, yeah, he, he was, was definitely in, under a lot of pressure. So that's it, I think. All games are done. 
Is that is that wow. right? Wow. Yeah, so Miami champions, eighth in their division, end up first in our hearts. In the Battle Royale, oh. And in our hearts. Oh. Hess, how how could this happen? What's your explanation for it? Well, if you look, you, you've already talked a bit about their lineup, yeah. Yeah, because look at board four. Richard Francisco, like he could have done much better against board four lineup. But look at board two in particular at Eduardo Iturizaga. He drew his last game against Movsesian, another very strong grandmaster. But what he did mm -hmm. is he was picked on some of the lower rated board twos. And I mentioned this earlier, for example, Andrew Tang, an amazing blitz player, amazing bullet player, but in a rapid format, it's harder for him because he's outrated by Iturizaga by something like 140 points. Um, right. Similarly, players like Dimitri Collars, low 25, maybe 25, 30, I forget the exact number, but Iturizaga is well into the 2600. So that difference makes itself felt. And so Iturizaga being pushed to board two and allowing Pavel Elyanov, four and a half out of seven doesn't look amazing, but look down board one, Alexandra. Do you see anyone doing better on that board? Nope. Nope. He's tied with Mamajarov and Tari, so So you feel like good result. company, huh? Yeah, good company. <laughs> exactly, there. exactly. I mean, Tari did very well today. He overperformed for sure. Yeah, Tari had a great day um, here, yeah. but unfortunately for Tari, his team did really well, but none of them could get to a plus score. Like Mihailov lost that pretty critical game to Bartholomew, misplaying the opening. Um, if you look down at the Lions, they, of course, could have gotten more from their board one and board four, Gawain Jones is definitely capable of more than two out of seven against that field. And similarly, of course, to Maroa, she just, I mean, she had plenty of good games. The quality of her yeah. games were there, but she blundered in critical moments. Seems right. like maybe she's not so used to playing quick chess and that yeah, came that back to her. Yeah, that queen blunder was so painful. Oh yeah, uh, queen digs d5. I think that was the hardest to, to stomach. <laughs> I mean, for me, if you just made me sum it all up here, so if yeah. I, I had to give out an MVP trophy, right? I see John Bartholomew, obviously, with his six and a half out of seven. But yeah, come on. John Bartholomew, just a clap for him. Yeah, he deserves it. But then I look over there at board two. I, I understand John Chi Wang, you know, he was great. But look at the separation between the champions and the blizzard. One point total. Look at board five. Uh, excuse me, board four. There's no board five. I was going to say a five point <laughs> difference between Bartholomew and Francisco. A tie between Wang and Beardson, but board two, right? Mm -hmm. Elyanov was expected to do better than Corrales, but Eduardo A. Terizaga, six out of seven against that field. I'm sorry, you know, he, he was playing at Safar Lee, Movsesian, Nixons, all these GMs, Cornet, and gets six out of seven. He's my MVP of the week, runner up to John Bartholomew. Yeah, absolutely. Kudos to the players who do deserve this. And obviously, thank you guys all for watching. Hopefully, this was a lot of fun. Mods, viewers, LDS Jedi Knight, I see you there saying thank you for the commentary. Well, we're, we're very happy you guys watched. And if you guys like it, hover over Hess's face. You can click the link to our channels and follow so that you can see when we go live as well. Oh, and the new results are posted. Oh, nice. So let me... So let me... Let's see how this changes things. All right. Miami champions from last to second last. Woo! Well, that's a good push for them because they're not far behind Pittsburgh. So honestly, exactly. they could really find themselves out of the doghouse, out of the rele relegation here, and into mm -hmm. just that neutral territory. And I'm looking at the standings of the site that like Greg just posted. The Marshals, mm -hmm. look at the Marshals. Half a point ahead of the Archbishops. They jumped way ahead of the windmills. The Archbishops got a big bonus for doing so well in the Battle Royale. In the Dallas mm -hmm. Destiny over in the Pacific Division, well, they jumped over the Pandas as well. So the Gnomes, by the way, the Gnomes, the Ari, Ariantari led Gnomes are in first place in their division. I wish I could, uh, I mean, I can screen capture it, but it'll take a while. So I'm tired. I don't want to deal with it. But the Gnomes, with a 15 point showing here, led by their steady board one, Ariantari, are in first place in their division. And I was making a joke earlier how they needed Magnus Carlsen. Apparently not. Who needs Magnus yeah. when you have these players here? So exactly. on that note, um, yeah, I mean, Terry Zaga, the man. John Bartholomew, I see you in the chat. You were great today, JB. And, yeah, um, amazing job. And, well, do you have any final words? I'm, I'm tired of talking, honestly. So I'm leaving it to you. Give final words about this pro chess league and everything going on to our lovely 
audience? Yeah, I, I think I'll just give you a shout out one more time. Robert, this is your second commentary session in a row. Obviously, the games were really exciting and you brought them to life even more. So I had a pleasure doing commentary with you. Well, the pleasure is always mine. Thank you to everybody. I see so many familiar faces. Well, so many familiar avatars. Oh, thank you, Face Chess. Face Chess, our pleasure here. And yes, a good of John Bartholomew, by the way, to give Flavio Perez a shout out because while JB went six and a half at a seven, so did Flavio on board four for the Blitzrooms, which means. True. Sorry, JB, you don't deserve MVP anymore. If someone else did what you did, psh, get out of here. No, on a serious note, congratulations to those who don't overlook players like mm -hmm. Flavio Perez, who had such a great showing. And unfortunately for him, his teammates uh, had a tough time, a, t a tough go of things. So right. I'm tired. Very, very true. I'm out of here. People telling me to do a third stream. No, I'm so done here. I've been at this since nine in the morning. Good evening, good morning, good night. I don't know where you are, but have a great time and stay here for the raid for Gotham Chess. Yes, you got to check out Gotham Chess. I think he was looking at uh, the Duda and Hikaru matchup. It might be over now, but he's still a cool guy. Yep, so we're out. Have fun, everybody.